suppose maybe we'll move on to other items on the agenda until we address that. So we're moving then to correspondence. And can I refer members to correspondence at tab 7 of the pack and to the correspondence memo at tab 7.1? So I'd like to draw your attention, members, to a number of items. Items 7.2 and 7.3 are responses from the Department to issues raised by members during briefings from the Minister on the 2nd of April and 23rd of April, respectively. Uh, do members have any comments in relation to those, uh, to those items? Chair, yeah, I, I don't know if, if we can, but uh, one of the agenda points it was Randox was referenced um, about testing. Um, can, can we inquire in terms of the, the nature of the contract and sort of the, the price involved in terms of the contract with the department and Randox? Um, I don't know how we normally uh, do that, but I would like to inquire and ask about that if that's possible. Paula? Yeah, my understanding from reading the papers was that the contract wasn't with us in terms of the financial. I think that was with the Department of Health in England. But they were, you know, that was where that, that was my understanding of the papers, so I don't think that the financial transaction, I don't know. I just assumed that that was, it was a UK wide. Yeah, well, but it, it, it was referenced, I think, to the, the, the SSE and another site. Yeah, oh yeah, the three by, sites, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, can we ask that question? And you may be right, Paula, but I will take, I'll take other views, Pam. Yeah, and um, that's my understanding of what Paula is saying as well. That's part of the kind of a UK wide provision. But it'd be good to get the clarity. Yeah. Uh, members on the phone, do you have any views on that? I'll go first to um, Alex. Um, no, I need to get the clarity. Sorry, who's speaking there, please? Alex. Yes, Alex, what did you say? I didn't pick it up. I think we need to get the clarity on the situation. Okay, and uh, Orlea? And Pat, do you have any? Yeah. <coughs> yes, Chair, uh, to, uh, just for clarity, are we dealing also with the uh, letter from the Department following the committee meeting of the 3rd of April? Sorry, Pat, say that again, please. Are, are we dealing... Uh, with the letter from the department regarding the 23rd of April committee meeting? Uh, we're dealing with items 7.2 and 7.3, which is the department response to a, a number of issues that were raised across a number of meetings, I think, Pat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought there was a lack of clarity in the response around the stopping of, of community testing and contact tracing. Um, Although we have been assured DMO that he he was acting on the basis of the uh, uh, expert scientific analysis was his uh, exact words. They, they say he seems to be reluctant to give that scientific evidence out so that we can interrogate it. And international best practice tend to suggest that. Even in situations such as North Korea, and there was an interesting documentary last night about it on Channel 4, where there was large-scale community transmission, contact tracing didn't stop in the whole country. It stopped in the locality where that uh, outbreak was. The rest of the country continued with community testing and contact tracing. So what I can't understand is why a decision was made by SAGE about stopping contact tracing across the water, but we also adopted that same policy at the same time. There's just no clarity from the department about that. Thank you. Okay, well, I just, I, I, I'm conscious, I suppose, that we are on Wednesday having both the, the minister and the chief medical officer back in front of the committee, I suppose. There's an opportunity there. In terms of the Randock situation, um, can I just clarify that members would like to? There is a broad agreement. I think the members would like to get some clarity on that contract. Eilish? Can I just uh, request a little more clarity on what the nature of the question is? But it's the nature yeah, of the contract. I mean, I'm just looking through the, the, the minister, and I think it was referenced about the UK wide contract, but I would just like to get a breakdown about uh, the nature of the contract in terms of how it pertains to here uh, and, and the cost in terms of payment uh, to Rondox as well. Um, okay. We may be told that that may be commercially sensitive or UK way, but I would like to request it um, regardless if I can. Colin, uh, you're yep. indicated. Um, thanks very much. And thanks. I see the, the answers to the questions that I had asked that they are contained in it as well. 
Um, I think that the initial uh, line in response to the one about is there equal distribu distribution of PPE equipment between NHS and nursing home staff. You know, I find the first line insulting. You know that there isn't because they're different sizes. But I'm sure there's a difference between different hospitals because I'm sure there's more goes to the Royal than goes to the Down because it's ten times bigger. So I think that's a, a lesson in the blatantly obvious um, in their first response. And I think that this is going to become an issue. It's going to grow because if we look at the problems that there is in the care home sector, um, we're going to be, you know. Whether we do an interim review at this stage or there's a, an investigation or an inquiry at the end, questions such as what PPE was given to the care home sector and at what stage are going to become incredibly, incredibly important. And I just get a sense from the answer that's there that there are still more questions because it's saying that, yeah, we give them what they asked for. Well, you know, did they know what they needed to ask for? This is a new pandemic. The, the nursing homes, were they advised of what they required and then they were allowed to get it? Uh, re requested and then they got it. So there's a timeline there that I think needs interrogated. But as you say, I think if we've got the minister next week, that's certainly a line of question and that I'd like to, to take up with them. And if we maybe were able to provide them with advance notice that we'll be asking that question so that they'll be able to have prepared answers and don't have to say that they'll come back to us the week later. Yeah, and, and I think I also noted that line in that response and I think it was it was blinding obvious and... and, and um, I think the committee understands very well that issue, that, that they're different scale, and I don't think we need to be told that, so I think that was uh, notable. Yeah. Um, yeah, just in the back of um, Colin's remarks there, I think too it's important that uh, when the Minister mentioned in terms of care homes yesterday, he mentioned training, uh, and it's always been a concern of mine that regardless of what PPE was provided, either by the homes themselves, the private homes themselves, before then the trust started to supply, um, was the appropriate training in place for those staff for the use of the PP? Because we un we know how important that is. That you know, that you can can easily infect yourself um, with you know donning and, and taking off of the PPE if, if that's not correct. That's um, high risk. So I, I would just like to, I would like to know whether the, that appropriate training was in place um, with the provision of the PPE. Whether that came from um, the homes. Um, privately themselves or from the trust. Okay. Um, Eilish, are you content or do you want to read back the question on Randox first, please? Um, so what I have is, uh, to, if the committee could please have some further detail on the nature of the contract, um, how it was arrived at, and a breakdown in terms of how it pertains to Northern Ireland and the costs associated with it. Yep, copy that. Thank you. Okay, members content. Yeah. Um, yes? Or Leah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it was just in, in some of the responses, and I appreciate that the minister is going to be at the committee next week, but um, we have been raising... Or Leah, sorry, just I'll interrupt you one second. We have someone joining us by the phone. I just want to check, and then I'll come back to you. Can I ask yeah. who has joined us on the phone there, please? Yes, it's uh, Sean Griffith. Good morning, Sean. You're very welcome. We'll be back to you there in a couple of minutes. Thank you. OK, bye. OK, or Leah, go ahead, please. Yes. So the documents that we have requested, um, we've already actually requested them with the Minister at previous committee meetings in relation to the testing strategy and in relation to the um, stock checks of PPE. Um, so I know in one of the responses it was saying that the <coughs> was also with BSO that they were going to share the documents, but I don't think that's good enough. I think uh, we've already raised it at the committee directly with with the minister and the CMO, so I mean, I I would like to see those documents. I don't know, you know, how we we'll, we we'll get them. It's certainly not what's contained within the within the PEX. Um, you know, it's it's really the food testing strategy that's been signed off from January to April, and similar to the internal stock checks. Okay, thank you, Orlea. I'll come back to that point in a second. I just want to. Uh, welcome. I think we have another member has joined us on the phone line. Can you please let us know uh, if you're there, please? Yeah, good morning. It's uh, Professor Anthony Costello from UCL London, based good, in Yorkshire. Good morning, Professor Costello, <laughs> and thank you. You're very welcome to our meeting. We'll be back to you there in a couple of minutes. Thank you. And um, we're just dealing with it with an item of correspondence, so we'll be back to the, our panel in a few minutes. Um, yeah, or Leah, in relation to that point, I, I also noted that response and I thought it was curious as well 
in, given the fact that the committee has asked for that document some time ago, um, and given the fact that BSO uh, are an arm's length body that the Department of Health have responsibility for, I think it would be obvious that they would just get the document to us between them. But that's that's um, that's something I think I think the committee. When we, when we seek information, we're seeking it for a reason in a context of time, and it's important that, given the time frames that are allowed, that, that uh, we understand that it may take a while, but it, that certainly has been stretching on now beyond what I think is acceptable, and I think it's, it's imperative that we get that very, very, very soon now. So, um, yeah, we have someone else, I think, joined us on the phone now. We, can I ask, is that a... Pro Martin McKee, have you joined us on the phone? I have. Okay, so we now have all of our expert panel on the phone lines. Um, I think we propose now and, and go to that section. We come back to correspondence uh, in, in where we have left off. So it was with a. Uh, let me just go back here a second. So, can I advise members that experts in the field of global public health are joining us today by teleconference? to brief the committee on lessons learned from the management of previous international pandemics in order to inform debate on next steps and mitigation of the risk of a second surge of, of COVID-19. So I'd like now very much to welcome and introduce our distinguished guests. I'd like to thank you all collectively for making time to be with us this morning and to say that we, we value your expertise and knowledge. Could I ask that all members on the phone if possible, mute. If you're not speaking, if you mute your phone, it will save some of the feedback that we're picking up in the room from coming through. And um, I will, I'll, if members then uh, unmute and indicate that they want in, I'll, I'll bring you in and everyone else, please remain on mute. Thank you. So I'd firstly like to welcome Professor Shan Griffiths, who is Emeritus Professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where she was formerly the Director of Public Health and Primary Care. Shan co-chaired the Hong Kong government's inquiry into the SARS epidemic in 2003. Since returning to Britain, she has been visiting professor at Imperial College London and associate non-executive advisory board member of Public Health England and chair of the Public Health England Global Health Committee. Martin McKee then is professor of European Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Research Director of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, <coughs> a partnership of universities, national and regional governments, and international agencies. Professor McKee was born in England, in Belfast, and studied medicine at Queen's University of Belfast. He is a past president of the European Public Health Association. Professor Anthony Costello is Professor of Global Health and Sustainable Development at University College London and an honorary fellow of the Faculty of Public Health. Having studied medicine at Cambridge, he specialised in paediatrics and neonatology and pioneered innovations in maternal care. He is a former director of the World Health Organisation, where he helped to lead the global strategy for women's children and adolescents' health. I would now like to invite each member of the panel to make their opening remarks before we have a roundtable discussion. We will start with Professor Griffiths for a look back at lessons from the SARS pandemic. Professor Griffiths, can you please uh, go ahead with your presentation? Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me here today to talk to you. As, as you said, Chairman, I'm going to talk a little bit about SARS. Um, SARS, as you will remember, uh, was also a coronavirus, but only identified part of the way through that epidemic. Um, the epidemic was first reported in Asia in February 2003, although it became again once again clear that the virus had been circulating for some months in mainland China beforehand. Uh, over, over the course of the next few months, the illness spread to more than two dozen countries in North America, South America, Europe and Asia before the global outbreak of 2003 was contained. Uh, in Hong Kong, SARS infected at least uh, 1,755 residents and killed 299 people and resulted in a fall in the GDP of 2.63%. The story has many echoes with COVID. Not only are both diseases coronaviruses, but there have been rumors of a severe chest infection in mainland China for several months before the first case was admitted to a Hong Kong hospital with atypical pneumonia. 
During the first phase, its unusual nature was recognized because it infected healthcare workers at one of the two medical schools in Hong Kong. This signaled both that it was a new disease and the seriousness of the epidemic potential. The disease then spread into the community, which meant it was no longer contained and into local care homes for the elderly. I think you'll see that this is a familiar story emerging. The origins, as suggested for COVID, were identified as coming from illegal trade in wet markets in China, with SARS probably spread through the sale of the wild civet cat to the reservoir in the bat population. I repeat this story of SARS because it helps to understand the success of Hong Kong in addressing COVID-19. If you move to our inquiry back in 2003, our inquiry was established with an international panel to, to review how well the government and the health system had done in containing the outbreak. There had been criticism of the government all the, and the health authorities all the way through the handling of the disease in the media. As, as a committee, we took the approach of identifying lessons to shape a future response to a pandemic. We were anxious that we didn't uh, undertake a witch hunt, and we didn't, but we didn't shy away from assessing the decisions that were made in the light of the knowledge at that time, uh, nor what was known later, not, not, not what was known later. Um, and I, I have to say this was a very useful way to approach the situation. In our inquiry, we made a series of recommendations. Uh, these included uh, the need to strengthen surveillance, the need to organize the public health system more effectively, and also to ensure the capacity and ability to amount a surge response within the hospital system in order to respond to future epidemics. Uh, we also stressed the need for a global network to ensure information was shared and research was open and collaborative not competitive. And we stress the need for transparency and communication with the public. I've attached the paper which summarizes more detail if people, are, if members are interested. So if you look at the COVID response, um, there, it's some, there have been some improvements on SARS, but not everywhere uh, and not well enough. Um, for example, I'd say some of the positive things are that uh, the overall response to COVID-19 has shown greater willingness to share experience and data, and the World Health Organization has played a very important role. Um, there's been impressive collaboration between scientists, not only in different countries, but in different sectors across public health organizations, academia, and industry, which wasn't seen in SARS. And there's an emphasis on evidence and research to provide guidance uh, about how to, the pandemic should be handled. So there's some, some things that have improved from SARS, but there are still some glaring problems, and I would include in those glaring problems the lack of capacity to test and the failure to supply protective equipment. Uh, and these problems seem to be far worse in situations, uh, some situations such as care homes and also in resource poor environments. Um, so once again, there's been some failure to respond to the uh, of the fact that public health advice said we needed to prepare for the inevitable global pandemic. If I just move back quickly to um, the experience of East Asia this time, I would argue that those jurisdictions who experienced SARS more acutely seem to have been better prepared, particularly Hong Kong, which has only seen four deaths amongst 1,050 cases. I think the features that characterize their approach are a focus on active containment, and I underline active containment, supported by high levels of testing. Uh, given its geographical location in China, Hong Kong obviously expected cases, and they instituted border controls and port of entry screening before, I underline before, the first case was identified. So the precautionary principle uh, there are still strict controls in Hong Kong on who can enter, and um, just you might be interested that all returning residents have to have a swab test before they can leave the airport as they come back into the country. Anyone testing positive has to go to hospital, uh, and uh, those traveling with them have to go to a quarantine center. Uh, residents have to complete a 14-day self-quarantine with strict surveillance, 
including the use of electronic wristbands paired with a mobile app. Uh, I had a on first-hand experience from one of my colleagues that the phone-based GPS checks take place every day, random video chats every two to three days, and random home visits are made. So you can see this is what we're talking about when we're talking about quarantine at the border. And we have seen how this approach on relying on testing and quarantine, both in Hong Kong and South Korea, have been used to suppress the second spike uh, of disease transmission. And every time a new case uh, is, is, is a, a new test is positive, this, uh, this uh, system kicks in again. So what is Hong Kong, how, why is Hong Kong successful and, and what can we learn? Um, I think that the, that the fact that Hong Kong acted early as soon as they understood the threat is very important. They've been rigorous in the identification and isolation of cases. Uh, testing has been key to implementing policy, underpinned by a strong surveillance system and use of the app. Uh, and they were quick to identify the second wave, and in uh, Korea, South Korea, even a third wave, and again in Hong Kong. And they take effective action. Uh, the communication with the public has, has been commended, and um, that's possibly the public is sensitized to SARS. So mask wearing, for example, is, it doesn't need to be made mandatory. Everybody does it. Hygiene practice levels are high, and social distancing measures are accepted. And, and these are flexible uh, uh, as, as the numbers ebb and wane. Um, so uh, another, in addition, I think the research community have been extremely active in sharing their lessons. Uh, and overall, uh, Hong Kong has provided a, a good example of active containment and of, re of gradually restarting uh, society post-lockdown. Uh, I think that I'd finally I'd, I'd finish by just saying that um, what the lessons that we could derive from the um, inquiry, that uh, we sum them up as the need for clarity, collaboration, communication, coordination, and capacity. Uh, and the, these, supported by information and communication, are, are really uh, underpin the Hong Kong response uh, and again, I would emphasize the, fa the facility to test is essential. So I hope that's been hopeful and uh, helpful, and uh, um, uh, Northern Ireland may be able to use some of the lessons uh, in releasing lockdown. Thank you, Professor Griffiths. Yes, that has been hugely helpful, and I think all of us here in the room and on the phone will recognize many of the elements and how, how closely the issues match across in terms of the previous SARS outbreak. Um, so I'll go now to our second guest this morning, Professor McKee. Are you there, Martin? I am. Good morning. Good morning, Martin. You're very welcome to our committee and thank you for coming along. Can you go ahead now, please, and, and uh, give us your presentation? Thank you very much. Well, just, I'd like to endorse everything uh, that Sean said. Uh, I also have links with Hong Kong University, with colleagues there. And I think one of the lessons from that is in um, Southeast Asia, there was a clear recognition from the very beginning that they were dealing with disease. They were dealing with SARS and not with influenza. And I think in Europe um, and the UK, I think an issue where there was a tendency to take the hands of influenza off itself uh, without thinking through the implications of why this would be different conditions. Uh, you're getting an echo. I'm not sure. There's, there's a slight echo, Martin. I'm wondering, is there maybe a bit close? Maybe we are, we're often asking people to hold the phone up closer, but maybe it's a wee I'll bit. I'll try that. Is that better? Yeah. Yes, that's better. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I would maybe like to pick up three areas which I think are important in going forward. And the first is that we really do need very robust information systems in place. And we have problems uh, throughout the United Kingdom in doing this at the minute. We need to know the level of immunity in the population. We've just got new evidence from Spain and France in the last 24 hours suggesting that the levels of immunity are somewhat lower than we would have hoped for, about 5% in the general population, maybe a bit higher in, in the Paris and Madrid regions, uh, maybe up to 10%. So that is a concern. But we also have to have really good information on testing 
and on uh, accurate, mort accurate and timely mortality data. I think there's been a problem with a fixation on the number of tests that have been done without thinking through fully why the tests are being done and what the information is that we need. And the reason for this is that we actually do need to be able to estimate accurately the reproduction number, the R value that everybody is now talking about. And as we go forward, the reason we need that is that for every measure that we take to ease the lockdown, I would argue that those making the decisions should be able to say, if we do this, we estimate that it will increase the R value by uh, whatever, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, something or other. And we should be confident that that will uh, still keep the overall value below one, because even going over one, just a tiny bit, will have a huge impact. The epidemic will grow rather than, than shrink. And that may mean that you do things that will uh, potentially take you above one, but you do other things to mitigate them, and that may take you into face coverings uh, and uh, so on. The other reason we need the data is that we desperately need to be able to identify resurgences. Uh, we need to identify new outbreaks. So the first thing is that we really need to improve the quality of the data, and compared to most other Europe, many other European countries, we still, I'm afraid, have a long way to go. The, the second issue, which may be of less interest to your committee, but I think we shouldn't lose sight of it, is that we now recognize that this is a complex multi-system disease, and we haven't fully got on top of how best to treat it. And the worry that we have is that a lot of this work is going on in silos. Um, I should say, in an earlier existence, I worked as a registrar, a medical registrar in the Royal and the City Hospitals a very long time ago. Um, in internal medicine and cardiology. And uh, there is a tendency for people to work in silos. I'm not commenting on Northern Ireland. I'm co talking about the UK-wide situation. And I think it's very important that we try to get everybody together from the different specialities and from the basic scientists, sciences to understand how we're going to go forward with the information that we already have. We don't have a magic bullet, but we are going to need some combination of treatment, which is likely to include if we can get them to work antiviral agents to kill the virus. Uh, and uh, secondly, to protect the target tissues. And there is emerging evidence, particularly in the way in which we might be able to reduce the impact on the lining of the blood vessels, the endothelial cells. And then thirdly, we need to be able to try to do something to mitigate the hyperimmune response that is often what kills people. That's the second area. And the third area that I think we need more work on is to actually look at what needs to be in place, to have a whole system map to say, if we're going to do the contact tracing, trace, test, isolate, support, and so on, we need to say, who needs to be part of this? What organizations need to be involved? What bits of local government? What bits of central government? What private sector organizations? Whoever. And having got a map of all of the functions that need to be in place, from having a register of the population to having a correct address system uh, to measuring the quality, the, the accuracy of the tests and the follow-up and who's, go who's going to do it, then we need to actually say, for each of those functions, who is responsible? Which organization, which bit of government, which bit of other bits, the services, perhaps uh, the um, police or the, um, the health service, or public health or whoever, and then map them onto that map. But above all, we need to have clear lines of accountability. So we need to say for everything, who has to talk to whom, and how do they communicate? And can they talk to each other at a local level, or do they have to go up to Stormont or to Westminster or wherever? And once we have done that, then we can overcome some of the silos and some of the problems that we've been facing so far. So three points, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, that was very, very useful also. And I'll now go to our third, just checking for uh, Professor Anthony Costello. Anthony, are you with us there? Yes, I am. Thank you very much, Anthony, and you're very welcome to this morning's <laughs> sessions. And once again, thank you for giving your time to provide us with your experience um, and knowledge. So could you go ahead now, Anthony, please, and give your presentation? Thank you. I'll try not to repeat what Sean and Martin have said. Um, just to say that I became interested in this in January, largely because I was doing some work with WHO at the time, and I became aware of this in early January, uh, soon after it had been declared by China on December the 31st, WHO set up 
um, their own management committee the next day. They put the information out on the 5th of January. And by the middle of the month, it was clear that this had a, a, a human-to-human transmission. And there was also evidence of spread into Thailand. Uh, WHO in China managed to get into Wuhan around the 20th and realized it had a much higher death rate than word had been uh, spread about. And by the 27th of January, I sent a tweet message, a DM, to one of Tedros's closest advisors, just saying, please declare a public health emergency of international concern, because otherwise you will be scapegoated because the previous meeting had not declared it. And of course, that's not WHO's fault because the committee is independent. Uh, But they did at their next meeting on the 30th declare a public health emergency of international concern. Uh, By that time, there was talk of a quarter of a million cases in Wuhan and spread already to 17 countries. And Tedros flew to uh, China to see the president. In fact, WHO did not get their independent group into China uh, until the 16th of February. So I'm rather defensive of WHO, which as an organization has been rather scapegoated uh, by various politicians. Their advice from day one has been that you need to find, test, trace, isolate, and do social distancing, but crucially, you must do it at speed. I followed things through February, and I couldn't really work out what the UK government was doing or what SAGE was saying. And then on March the 12th, I was really horrified to hear that the UK policy was to stop buying test, trace, and isolate, to introduce no lockdown, and to go for a herd immunity policy, which seemed to me to be completely irresponsible, especially as Korea at that time had already suppressed their epidemic because they started an aggressive testing policy nearly three weeks earlier, and they've ended up with 250 deaths. And Greece, for example, which did relatively little testing, introduced a full lockdown Uh, before they had a single death. And they've ended up with about 140 deaths. So subsequently, we could move forward to um, March the 23rd. By then, we did go into a lockdown, reversing the earlier decision. Um, But we've suffered an enormous explosion because of this delay in both cases and deaths. And there was growing concern from myself and many others who commented And two weeks ago, Sir David King, uh, the former chief scientific advisor, was concerned about the transparency and independence of SAGE, and so decided to set up an independent SAGE. I was approached, Martin was approached, and there are 13 members at the moment. And I think you've had our report. Just finally, I would say, uh, Professor David Spiegelhalter has said, Uh, correctly, that it is difficult across Europe to draw up league tables of deaths on the grounds that there are different age structures, socioeconomic structures and the like. So comparing Ireland with Italy would be uh, dangerous. However, if you look at rates per million and the data that uh, is available, so at the moment uh, we have, I believe, 32,000 Uh, In fact, the real number is likely to be over 60,000, as the Financial Times has reported, because they uh, project forward the number of community care home and unreported cases to the present day. And the number of cases presented at press briefings are around 4,000, yet John Edmonds presented to the select committee, he's on the stage, Uh, last week that uh, he thinks there is 20,000 cases per day. So we need to think of that. And if you turn that into rate per million of population, the UK would be at 841, Germany at 93, Finland at 51, Greece 15, 
South Korea five, Japan five, Australia and New Zealand four. So we are, you know, 200 times the death rate probably of Australia and New Zealand. And that comes back to my final point, which is why three months into this epidemic, certainly in England, we have failed completely to set up an integrated local find, test, trace, and isolate policy. You know, if you're ill, you see your GP. Your GP is able to diagnose, to test, to organize tests. And if it's a notifiable disease, you can use your local public health teams, outbreak management teams, health protection teams. Yes, we would need some contact tracing support, but that should be built into a local public health response. Uh, we do not have that. We are appointing new czars every day. We are using Serco for contact tracing, Deloitte for testing, Boston Consulting Group. It, the whole thing is completely non-joined up. And if there's a note of impatience in my voice and less diplomacy than usual for a select committee, it's because I believe that we're heading into a second wave much more quickly than we need to be. Uh, and I'm very worried that we are starting to lift lockdown measures at a time when, although our R value may be below one in the community, it's certainly not below one in care homes and hospitals, that we still probably have 20,000 cases, and that might mean 300,000 plus contacts every day. We're not in a position to suppress this virus. And we're simply trying to manage it in a half-hearted way in England. And I'm so pleased that Northern Ireland is taking a different view and is uh, adopting the WHO principles rather than the uh, PHE principles or the, the government in, in Westminster. I think I'll stop there. I think I've been controversial enough. OK, thank you, Anthony. And thank you to all of our contributors there. Um, and I suppose um, in relation to where we sit now, and, and I agree, this is a particularly, a particularly dangerous time because the care home situation is still running hugely worryingly high in terms of the number of cases and the number of deaths that are coming from that sector. But in terms of, in terms of this committee at this point in time, what are the key things that we should be focusing on and what are the key questions we should be asking at the present time? That's to the panel there, to anyone in the panel. Well, I, I, I would say you really need to ensure that you... I, I absolutely agree we need a strong local public health coordinated response, which I think both Martin and Anthony have highlighted. And as part of that, you do need to make sure you've got the testing capacity uh, to do the contact tracing in the community should, as lockdown is lifted. Yeah. yeah, I would fully Thank agree you, with that. Yeah. Could, could the speakers just identify for, for who they are? Yes, so sorry. We can, we Martin know McKee, I would fully agree with that. I think there needs to be a real strengthening of the, uh, the data. I mean, I am aware that there have been some problems with the statistics in Northern Ireland um, that the uh, National Statistics Authority raised some concerns about. Uh, but I think making sure that those data are, of the, um, are very timely and are presented in a way that is fully transparent is crucial because that, that underpins everything else. What, one of, sorry, it's Anthony here. Yes, sir. Um, one of the issues about being local and joined up is when you find a case, the person is frightened, uh, got symptoms, and if they can have a test, they want to know the result quickly. China got their lab test time down from four days to three hours in about a week. Um, they got the time from onset of symptoms to test result from 12 days down to three days. That's what we need. We need when a person thinks they've got it, whether they phone 111 or report something to their GP, that they get a test quickly 
It should, in my view, be a swab collected at general practice surgeries that have hot, hot space to, for infection control, which is most of them. Send it off, get the result the same day or 24 hours maximum. Um, and then somebody, it could be one of our 750,000 volunteers who are clinically trained or maybe from other resources, do the contact tracing. Of course, people will trust their GP with information because they know they keep things confidential. And then you need a proper isolation policy, a proper quarantine. At the moment in Britain, in, sorry, I'm, in England, it seems that you just tell people to self-isolate and to self-isolate for seven days. Well, that's not correct. WHO say 14 days. And of course, you need to differentiate. If a person is sick, they need to go to hospital. If they're unwell but don't need to be in hospital but can't cope at home, they may need to be in a community facility. You will have vulnerable people, people with mental health problems or drug addiction, who also need to be looked after outside the home. And in multi-generational households, you may need to separate younger contacts from elderly contacts. So you may need to requisition hotels. All of this was done in Asian countries. I haven't heard this being done, except when we had our first few imported cases where we put them into special uh, facilities and looked after them. So if we don't have a proper quarantine policy, we're not actually going to uh, stop local home-based infection, and we're going to carry on with too high a level of cases. Thank you. Um, thank you all for those. Second question for me then would be in relation to the this, the Sage Independent Report identified the fact that um, and it has widely been recognised Ireland as a single epidemiological unit for the purpose of of dealing with um, out, this outbreak and and those types of pandemics. Um, so what would that look like in terms of a, a joined up policy and, and Sean mentioned collaboration in terms of a joined up policy across the island what would those measures look like at this point in time from your experience? Over to the panel please. Well, it's Martin McKee here. I'm happy to come in on that one and if nobody else does. Um, yeah, we already have a situation where the island of Ireland is treated as one for animal health, so it just seems rather surprising not to treat it as one for human health. And, uh, you know, uh, the island, being an island, does have an advantage, and we see this in uh, New Zealand, for example. It was able to uh, impose uh, restrictions that have kept their death rate down to, I think, double figure or very, very low numbers. So I think um, it just... Uh, there's a, a, clear, a clear argument for having consistency of policies. I think as we move forward, there is this problem that is still unresolved as the government in Westminster moves to uh, require a, a period of quarantine of people coming from abroad. And uh, it was rather, I was rather surprised when I heard this that they would exempt the Republic of Ireland because, of course, anybody can come in on a plane from New York to Dublin and then just jump on a plane or find another way of getting across to Great Britain. And it, uh, the same issue with France. I've never quite understood they're, they're talking about some agreement with France, whereas obviously people can move across borders into France from elsewhere. And uh, so therefore it would seem logical to treat the two islands, the two large islands of the, of the British Isles as separate uh, sanitary units. Uh, as, as, as I say, is done for animals. It just seems to make... I can't, see a, I can't see a public health argument about it. Obviously, being from Northern Ireland, I'm not naive, and I realise there may be political problems, but if we're following the science, the science would clearly take us in that direction. Thank you, Martin. Just uh, yeah. a couple of quick points. Um, the first is that in our independent state report... Um, we, we had turned to um, one of the world's most impressive and cited 
uh, mathematical models in another area of neurobiology, Professor Carl Friston. And a month or two ago, he had started modeling the COVID epidemic. And he says that um, although the calculation of our values has been given great um, prominence, um, he suggests that actually there are alternative approaches that could complement that approach because the R value is basically a calculation of the spread of infection about two weeks earlier. So it's a historical model. And he does a thing called dynamic causal modeling, which is a way of looking forward. And he has done this for actually data sets in America. So for example, you could say in Northern Ireland, if we had a devolved social distancing and, you know, FCTI surveillance policy, would, if it was based on local prevalence estimates, would that be more effective than, say, a centralized mass testing approach? Or, you know, there may be other questions that you can ask. So I think the combination of those two um, is very important. Thank you. And, and one of the other things is, of course, on March the 12th, when we gave up um, testing, tracing, and the like across the country, we were treating it as one epidemic. And, of course, at that time, many, many, I mean, many hundreds of local authorities had less than 10 reported cases. So there was no reason to stop the contact tracing in those kinds of authorities. And I imagine, I don't know the figures for Northern Ireland, but I imagine you have pretty few contacts, uh, cases, and um, deaths at that time. And I agree with Martin that in treating Northern Ireland is more uh, about the island advantage that you have with the South um, would be uh, very sensible for policy point of view. Okay, thank you. Sean, were you looking in on that issue at all? Um, I, I just to say, I, I would support the uh, one island approach from uh, the arguments that have been made. Okay, thank you. Um, so, members, I'm going to now come up with a few indications in the room. I have Paula, Jerry, Pam, and Colin in that order, and then I'm going to go to the phone in the order that people came in on the phone, which was Alex, Orlea, and Pat. So I'll, I'll go then across to you, Paula, please. Um, thank you, and good morning, panel. It's great to have you here this morning. Um, here in Northern Ireland, our, our latest figures would show that about two-thirds of the deaths are amongst people 80 years and above. How do they compare uh, globally, and what should we be doing better to protect our vulnerable elderly? Thank you. Panel, please. Thank you. Martin. Yeah, I'm happy to take that. Just uh, difficult when we're doing it on the phone. Yeah, well, uh, I'd need to check the exact comparisons, but that's broadly similar to what we're seeing elsewhere. Uh, and uh, there is a clear association with age. There is also an association with gender, with men being more uh, likely to die than women, and uh, with ethnicity for reasons that are still poorly understood. Uh, what can be done? Well, I've been very critical from the very beginning at the, uh, you know, when we're looking at care homes in particular. I should say as background to this, in my previous uh, research in the uh, 1990s, I did quite a lot of work looking at prisons in Russia and former Soviet Union and subsequently at mining communities in sub-Saharan Africa. And these are what we call institutional amplifiers. So once the disease, and we were looking at TB and HIV, gets into one of these institutional amplifiers, it spreads rapidly. But because there is movement in and out, I mean, in prisons, it's staff, obviously, but with mining communities, it was people going from South Africa back to Mozambique and Lesotho and Swaziland and so on. And then in the communities, they amplify the infection, and then they take it back and they spread it into the communities. So I think um, in the, the care... The, uh, the, as you know, there was a debate about what was said when in response to Prime Minister's questions in Westminster yesterday. But I think to have had at any time advice that people in care homes were not at risk was um, very strange in light of what we know about these facilities. And particularly because we saw exactly this happening on cruise liners at the very beginning, another form, maybe an upmarket form of institutional amplifier. Uh, so I think. Uh, the, the issue around care homes, we cannot get away from that. I think also we do need to step back a little bit as well because 
Of course, this has been a problem in Italy, it's been a problem in Spain, but it hasn't been so much of a problem everywhere else. And one of the factors, I'm, when this will come in any subsequent inquiry, looking at the United Kingdom, has been that we do have a relatively low level of hospital capacity, and there was a push to get people out of hospitals to save the NHS, itself a laudable objective, but it did mean that people were being taken out of hospitals into care homes and seeding the infection in there and then more broadly in the community at a time when the testing regime was not well established. So uh, there is a biological vulnerability. Older people are definitely more vulnerable for a whole series of reasons. Um, but uh, coupled with that, I think a, a lot of older people are in, uh, in settings where they are particularly at risk of this institutional amplification. The second question, yeah, and, uh, it's really just you haven't mentioned the, the, the fee word, the vaccine word, and you, I think you all spoke about the need for worldwide collaboration on that. Where, what's your understanding of where we are in terms of finding a vaccine? Well, Sir John Bell uh, was talking about that on, on the Today programme this morning. So there are, uh, certainly in the Oxford trial, now over a thousand people recruited and there seem to be no major side effects. As you know, um, this, uh, there are questions about whether the antibodies that are uh, created, uh, uh, that will be created hopefully with the vaccine, will be protective um, and that whether that will be sustained uh, or whether you will get mutations in the virus. There are a number of features of this, vir this particular coronavirus compared to some other coronaviruses that actually are quite optimistic just in terms of the nature of the spike that we keep talking about and the way in which it's exposed and not protected by glycan sugars and things like that. Um, and also with the fact that although it is mutating, it seems to be mutating relatively slowly compared to some others. Uh, but it would be remarkable to get a vaccine out um, within this calendar year. Uh, it would be an incredible achievement. And uh, one of the difficulties, of course, and this was the problem with um, SARS, um, was that you need to have enough of the virus circulating in the community for people to be at risk of getting it. And, of course, we're doing all the things with social distancing to reduce that risk. Otherwise, you won't know whether the group that get the vaccine and the control group, actually there's a difference. Um, so that's, that's a huge challenge. And that's leading people in the U.S. to talk about challenge uh, studies whereby young, healthy, otherwise healthy people might be given the vaccine. And uh, that's quite controversial, as you might imagine. So uh, we are, it, this has been a superhuman effort. It's been very, uh, it's made a lot of progress so far. But we, we also just do need to be clear that we hope we will get a vaccine, but we cannot be absolutely confident that we will. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Okay, thank you very um, much. <coughs> yes, Sean? I was just going to add that... Uh, even once we have the vaccine, getting it, getting the policy for getting it uh, produced at, uh, at um, enough quantity and distributed to the right people, etc., etc., will take quite a lot of effort as well. <coughs> yep, thank you. Um, um, Anthony, yeah? Just one other thing. I, I'm a little bit more uh, worried about the prospect for a vaccine than I was. I hope I'm wrong, and Martin is right that there may be things about this virus that, that uh, are encouraging. But at the moment, uh, as he said earlier, the serology tests we have, Spain, 5% have got antibodies. Oxford, I know of a study where it was 6.6%. Geneva, 9%. So let us say that only 10% have made antibodies in this stage of the virus. Um, now, if that reflects everybody that was infected gets antibodies, then that means the infection fatality rate is high. In other words, we will have had 60,000 plus deaths uh, from a, a virus only spreading to 10% of the population. And you can do the sums. If it went through 60 or 80%, it would be a much, much higher death rate if it spread through the population. If, on the other hand, only a very few people get the antibody response, and there are a lot of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic people who do not make antibodies, then that suggests that creating an immune response is quite difficult. And that may be more negative from the point of view of developing a vaccine. And then you've got the problem that even if you develop a vaccine by, say, end of the year, it could, as Sean says, take another 
one, two years to get this manufactured up and to all the population of the world. And so we're going to be living with this virus for several years, and we should be making plans for that. Okay, thank you, panel. That's very interesting. Um, Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, panel, for your presentations. Um, Sean, in your uh, um, paper to the, the committee, you mentioned about um, governments feeling to heed the, the public health um, advice, and that's something they, something that I would certainly concur with, and, and lots of people would as well in terms of the British government, but also uh, the executive here. And I think Anthony mentioned about um, in January, early January, um, uh, the, the obviously the warnings uh, and the, the development of the virus there, and I think some epidemiologists and, and scientists were warning even before that, I think about the possibility of, of viral infections uh, developing and, and spreading. I'm, I'm also aware that from SARS, um, the WHO developed uh, a project around 11 lab laboratories in nine countries to have a collaborative research project um, to tackle that. Uh, and you mentioned about a coordinated approach needed. Um, do you, does the panel think that now is the time uh, to either expand already existing bodies or to create new bodies uh, of public health uh, organisations to deal with not only this crisis, but also any new uh, viruses that may uh, develop in the future? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do you want to pick up on that one, Sean? Yes, <coughs> yes, of course. Um, I think that you need to think about public health organisations at different levels. And I think we've, we've already made the case for having strong public health at a local level as, as an effective way of, um, uh, of dealing with this crisis. Uh, but uh, the global role played by WHO shouldn't be underestimated. Um, and I think we need to really make sure that our existing organizations, such as WHO, are strongly supported. Because you'll know that um, the US, uh, Mr. Trump has been less than complimentary. He's threatened to withdraw funding. He's very, has been a destabilizing influence on the, uh, on the power of WHO, accusing it of being biased towards China. So I think we just have to depoliticize that and think about the importance of WHO in terms of making sure that it can help coordinate a response to low- and middle-income countries and not just think of ourselves. So really, after the event, we need to think, that, you know, does WHO need strengthening in some way? And I think I would welcome that. Rather than thinking of new organizations, use what we've got. Strengthen our local <coughs> organizations, strengthen our national organizations, and strengthen our global organizations. Can I jump in there again, Martin, again, if, just to jump in briefly, because, of course, we absolutely need the global organizations. But, um, and I realize I'm probably getting into the lion's den by even raising this issue, um, but we do have the European Centre for Disease Control in Stockholm, and it has played a very important role. The there are going to be enormous difficulties in the future. Uh, we already have a situation where Switzerland... Um, which is outside the, uh, the single market and has been struggling to try to develop a working relationship. Uh, the, uh, as we know, the, until the end of the transition period, the UK staff can still uh, be involved, and there's been a lot of debate back and forward about missing emails and all sorts of things. But I think looking ahead for the island of Ireland, this is going to be a challenge that somebody is going to need to grapple with uh, to work out how uh, you, you at least do in, in Northern Ireland can try to find some way of continuing to benefit from th these relationships. Thank can you. I just add? Yeah, go ahead, Anthony. Uh, one quick thing. I mean, the World Health Organization and its regional offices have a technical role and a political role. And I believe the technical role, particularly around uh, Martin's suggestions about CDC, Centers for Disease Control around the world in every region, is a very important one. But just to say that um, WHO, for the last 30 years, has been progressively underfunded because the assessed contributions from countries have remained frozen as a result of an initiative initially from President Reagan. And you've now got the President of the United States threatening to withdraw all funds from it. Just to give you an idea of how they are begging, uh, in early February the 4th, Dr. Tedros put out a call for $675 million to help WHO 
protect countries around the world, which is actually a very small sum. I met him a month later on March the 4th and asked him how it was going. I said, I see you've had commitments of $120 million. He said, commitments, yes. Do you know how much I've received? And I said, no. He said, $1.2 million. So six weeks into a, well, more, two months into a pandemic, the World Health Organization, which actually has an annual budget no larger than my university in London, had received $1.2 million from all the countries of the world to help them fight a pandemic. I think it's an utter disgrace. And I think uh, I'll quote Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, who said that the President of the United States used to cut funding to WHO was a crime against humanity. Thank you, Anthony. And that is certainly a stark, a stark and a, and a disturbingly worry, a very worrying figure in terms of the, the scale of response to a global pandemic. Um, I'm going now to Pam, please. Thank you, panel, for your attendance. It's very much appreciated um, today. Um, and uh, I'd note that uh, you have uh, mentioned the, some of the data coming back, that some of the early data in terms of immunity levels. Uh, from other parts of the world, and I'm just wondering um, what your opinion is on how each wave of the virus um, will differ, and is it possible that there may be five or six waves um, that could take place before we have a vaccine? Thank you, Pam. And uh, is there some of our panel wants to pick up on that first? Um, just, just to say. Uh, it's very difficult to predict because viruses behave in different ways and that we don't fully understand. So this is not a prediction. But I suspect that we won't get huge waves like we've had now, although we could do. But some would say that because people are already sensitised to social distancing, that in a sense they will carry on doing that regardless of what government policy is. So the, the, the likelihood is that you have a high level of endemic rather than epidemic surges, you know, uh, lower surges lasting a longer time. But I might be completely wrong here. I don't know what Martin thinks. I just don't know. I, I think yeah, the danger is that, again, going back to my earlier criticism of treating this as pandemic influenza, um, you know, we do know that there's a seasonality in, pan in influenza that there may not be, although there are still really important questions. There is some seasonality with other coronaviruses, but not all. So I think we're very much in the dark. We still need to understand much better what's happening in Africa. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it is what we can see in, in the tropics and actually Ecuador, literally on the equator, um, is extremely worrying. So um, I think, uh, I th I think the, the, the gaps in our knowledge are still very, very substantial. Uh, can I just come in here? Yes. Uh, Pam, in um, the Far East, they found the risk has been with the imported cases. So for Hong Kong and for mainland China, at Easter, when all the students were going back, they were taking back... Uh, infection from the US and Europe, and it was in and both uh, situations, uh, I, I know particularly about Hong Kong, they then had to really ramp up the testing and the quarantine and the isolation in the way that I described. And that was the second wave, and they managed to get through that. They've had no cases for a while, except for a single case that's just emerged. So, and, and what they then do is they respond very quickly. So they're not getting waves, but they're getting small, isolated uh, outbreaks. And uh, the same for South Korea, um, where they opened up the clubs. Uh, what they found was that they had one case who infected about 50 people. And they've been doing a huge contact tracing focused on that series of clubs. Thank you. Yeah, Pam, go ahead. Yeah, and thank you for that, Paul. And on the, on the back of that question, um, I'd like to ask you, what should our economic recovery look like and um, how would staggered working operate? And along with that, 
your views on uh, face coverings or masks. Yeah, over to a panel there. Who would like to pick up on that? Well, I don't mind picking up a mask. Yeah. In, or face coverings or, or um, what, other than the words that they're being called. Um, I think that the argument here is that it's a precautionary principle. We think that they may contribute to protecting other people who come into close contact with you as lockdown is, uh, is, is released. Um, and so in, in general, there is a recommendation to wear uh, face coverings that can be cloth, that can then be washed at 60 degrees and reused, uh, particularly when you go out of the house. I think it meets, the big danger is using up valuable PPE and there are ways around that. So uh, mask, mask wearing, as I say, in uh, Asia is, is absolutely common, not just in this situation, but in any situation where someone has an upper respiratory infection. Can I jump in? It's Martin again. I'm, I actually fully agree with that, and I think maybe all three of us will, in fact, although there are obviously different views in, in, elsewhere. And uh, I think people have actually misunderstood this. And as Sham said, we're talking about face coverings, and I would avoid the use of the word masks because that creates confusion, confusion with PPE. Nobody is talking about taking away surgical masks or respirators from health and social care workers. This is just something that will interrupt the flow of breath from you. And, and the reason why I, I've changed my mind and I'm in favor of them now is that first, I think an awful lot of the evidence that people looked at was around influenza. And this is a different disease. This is spread whenever people are either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, um, as well as when they are symptomatic. And therefore, just wearing a mask whenever you're infected and you know you've got the symptoms is not going to help with that. <coughs> Secondly, uh, the studies that have been done have often looked at the protection of the person who is wearing the face covering, whereas this is very much about source control. This is about protecting other people. Now, that then implies that you would want everybody to wear them, because what happens is that people spread droplets. They then get into the air. The droplets dry out, and they become an aerosol, which then floats around in a way that a droplet wouldn't, because it would fall to the ground. And just simply having that covering to prevent the droplets getting out uh, and catching them can make a difference. And there's nice work from Hong Kong looking at that and showing that it does seem, they do seem to be more effective with coronaviruses than they are with either influenza or with the other common cold virus, the, the rhinovirus. Uh, so I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in, in favour. Um, just Anthony here. Yes, Anthony. Um, <laughs> The first question was about the economic effects. Um, as we've seen, the stock markets have rebounded very quickly in the past month because they're hopeful of a V-shaped recession and they're predicting that everything's going to get back to normal in two or three months, a bit like after SARS-1 and MERS. Um, I think uh, they're making a big mistake. This is a doctor talking now, not an economist. But, you know, you have seen massive central bank intervention. Most of the big stock market companies going up are the major tech companies. But I have serious concerns that this is going to last for at least two years, that the oil industry, the aviation industry, the hotel hospitality, uh, restaurants, international trade, cruise liners, universities, we're heading into a big recession, and some respected economists, like Professor Nouriel Roubini in the States, believe that we should be heading into a depression by next year. So the, I think the best we can hope for is not a V-shaped recession, but a bath-shaped one, or even a very, very prolonged uh, suppression of our economy. I hope I'm wrong, and I may be talking nonsense. Anthony, I should, maybe I could jump in and tell you that the uh, stock market has fallen substantially this morning. Um, it was about an hour ago. It was down about 2.5%. So I think people are paying heed to that. Uh, I should say that there is quite a lot of work. Colleagues of mine in the United States have looked at the effect of the, uh, the economic impact of um, pandemic influenza in 1918-19. 
and there each of the cities closed down and opened up at different stages. And that makes very clear that those uh, cities that closed down earliest and stayed closed down for longest recovered much better by the time you got to 1924, 1925. So this yeah. argument that it's an either-or, we published a paper in Nature Medicine which looked at uh, some of this evidence, which I'd be happy to circulate. Uh, but I think it's, uh, the, the, what, the other things that come out very strongly are the government's approach to furloughing is actually very good because it then means that whenever we are able to recover, uh, you've got people still in jobs. You're protecting particularly the small and medium enterprises that are at risk of failing. Now, I think they could do more, and there is a lot of talk about how the government has spent a great deal, but actually, in com comparative terms, German government and other governments have actually spent a considerable amount more in terms of their GDP than the UK has. But that's not to knock what has already been done. It is very important to make sure that we actually have businesses that are maintained and, and held over, a bit like you would put somebody on a life support machine, allowing them to uh, remain alive uh, so that then whenever the, the virus is eventually defeated, they recover. I think looking at it in the same way is very important. Yeah. Thank you, panel. I'll now go to Colin McGrath. Colin, please. Thank you very much, and thank you to the panel for um, giving us the, the, the information this morning. I suppose um, you're at a, a benefit there from understanding all of this, and many of the public don't, um, so they're just sort of following instructions, but there are many out there that would like to follow the instructions with a bit more knowledge, and, and there is a task of trying to explain that um, to people, and I know that um, rather than asking a question of um, Shan, just that you know, one of the lines you said was after the SARS, it was there would be an inevitable global pandemic, and I think that when this all passes, we will have to review that if we were expecting a global pandemic, why were we not prepared for it? Um, but if I could ask one question of Martin and then one of Anthony, the question for Martin is: Could you give us a, a sort of layman's definition of the R figure? We kind of know what it is. It's the number of people that you will pass it to. But how do you actually determine that? How do you work out what the R figure is? And then what impact does that have? And to say, if you could try and keep that, if we keep it at the standard that I'll understand it, I think you'll be doing pretty well at a layman sort of <laughs> definition of that. And then the, the question to Anthony then, again, just to comment, you said, you know, I think you've answered me this one, because I was going to ask, is it your view that the cessation of testing on the 12th of March caused more deaths? I think you've answered that one. And again, that's one that's going to come out in the wash afterwards that the British government will have to respond to, that that stopping of that testing um, potentially could have caused a spike and increase in the number of deaths that there were. But here we talked about the containment stage and the delay stage. And at that point, we asked our chief medical officer about testing. And there was almost a response that testing isn't the silver bullet. You don't need to worry about it. And then about two or three weeks later, that changed. And I just want to know, do you think that's something that our chief medical officer should have been more concerned about, um, say, about five or six weeks ago? Thank you. Okay. Well, maybe I'll start. And um, I, I mean, I'm not going to comment on what Michael McBride said or didn't say, but uh, I think the, you've really picked up on a very, inter a very important question. And as a number of people have said, calculating the R value is not straightforward. Um, in, an ideal in an ideal world, you would have de almost daily testing of people, and you would be able to see who met who and how they passed it on. And there is some work that is being done in a research setting uh, looking at the degree of spread using very minor genetic variations in the viruses. Um, so, for example, in the United States, they've been able to say in some states it was caused by you know, just one person coming in and either from Europe or from Asia because they can differentiate the virus and then it spread within the communities. But the way in which the R value is being cal calculated is it's a number of ways. So some work by colleagues of mine uh, at the London School have been actually using surveys to see how many people uh, are taking the data on the infections and then mixing it with uh, or combining it with data on how many contacts people are having and working it out from there. So it is an estimate. Um, clearly, without having a high level of testing, you're going to be guessing to some extent. Uh, but again, it's usually with modeling data to try to calculate this and saying, well, if we're getting this, then the R value would have to be, um, be that. And, but it, it's, it's, not a very, it's not a straightforward issue. And um, also, there are 
even within any society, as, as Anthony said earlier, it will be different, for example, in care homes from in the general population. Um, but the, uh, you asked me to, to explain it to you in very simple terms. I have to say it's not. Um, uh, I'm not sure that I can actually do that. Uh, and uh, many people have tried to, because you can say, well, what is it? And you've, you've captured it perfectly well. It is the number of people it's transmitted to. But calculating that, you're taking a whole lot of different bits of information and combining them, and you're calculate, back calculating from that. I think you mentioned also uh, the idea that something might be a silver bullet, and I really would like to put that one to sleep very firmly. Nothing is going to be a, sing a, a silver bullet in this. And when I was talking about medical treatment, I was saying you're going to need a combination of treatments against the virus uh, to protect the tissues that are being infected and to deal with the immune response. It's not going to be like penicillin was uh, for streptococcal infection or something like that. It's going to be a combination of measures. Uh, but testing, we, we really need to get the testing up because the more testing we have, the more information and the more confident we can be that we've got the R value. Uh, I haven't really answered your question, I realise. You've, you've tried, Martin, you've tried very hard. Uh, and Anthony then? Just very quickly, um, clearly by removing the fine test trace and no lockdown on March the 12th, we were hitting the exponential part of the curve, which means things are happening very, very fast. And if we were doubling every two days and we had 20,000 cases, then 14 days later you'd have 1.2 million. So without question, the decisions taken that day must have influenced the size of the epidemic and therefore the number of deaths. But I've said all along that this should be a no-blame audit for now. We shouldn't be pinpointing individuals I think that the scientific advisory group of experts had a lot of very, very good people on who were giving their time and advice uh, as, as best they could. I think there was a misjudgment based on pandemic influenza, as Martin has said. I think there was some British exceptionalism that we knew best. I think we should have um, been in contact with the international people much more, uh, particularly in Hong Kong and Singapore and the like. But the worst thing, in my view, was that there was no independent public health voices on that stage. You know, if you'd had Sean or Martin there, I think that the uh, decisions made would have been challenged much more. Now, Jeremy Hunt, a couple of days ago, said uh, this was the biggest failure of scientific advice to ministers in our lifetime. There may be some truth in that, but what worries me a lot in relation to the CMOs, the deputy CMOs, the advisors. These are civil servants, and they mustn't be used as human shields for politicians um, because they are limited by what they can say by virtue of being civil servants. And, um, you know, with the Northern Ireland chief medical officer, as I understand it, he was allowed to attend SAGE and listen, but not ask any questions. So I, I would not be putting blame on specific people at all. This was a systemic failure in Britain, and we need to really look at the reasons why this happened. Can I just support Anthony in that? I think it's really important at this point, until we're absolutely through the uh, pandemic, that we don't apportion blame. Because in the SARS inquiry, what we tried to do was to say this decision was made at this time because these were the conditions and this was what was known. And that enabled us to really unpick some of the feelings that were there, uh, which are very natural. But I think we do need to do the analysis post hoc and then move forward um, rather than uh, to having, the, having a blame culture. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go now to the phones, and the first member that I had indicated would be asking on the phone there is Alex Easton. Are you there, Alex? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you okay. Okay, um, thank you so much for your presentation. It's been very um, interesting. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, Jan, um, you mentioned about the pandemic in Hong Kong um, and the animal market. Do these animal markets that are in China need to be closed down permanently? And if so, how can we do that? Because it's China we're talking about. Um, in terms of Anthony, um, you mentioned um, a 
about herd immunity. We were told at the very beginning of this that we shouldn't go into lockdown too soon because there needed to be a period of time for herd immunity to increase. And also, you mentioned about the death levels um, are probably a lot higher than we know. How can we get to the bottom of the actual figures for that, in your opinion? Um, the last one is to Martin about um, the low levels of immunity across Europe, and you were talking between about 5 and 10 percent. Why is that the case? Okay, thank you, Alex. And can I go to the panel, please? Uh, shall I just deal with the wet market question? Um, I think there's a, a bit of confusion sometimes in the way we use language. And um, wet markets are just fresh markets where people in many parts of the world go to get fresh vegetables. The real risk in coronavirus spread uh, has been um, the wild animal trade, which is often illegal, but takes place within the wet markets. And it's been the wild animal trade. Uh, in SARS, it was with civet cats. Uh, and this time around, no one's absolutely clear. So we don't want to make any pronouncements. But in both, both uh, situations, the coronavirus has been found in bats. Uh, it's not the bats that are necessarily sold. It, it's the bat transfer it to another animal, that then goes to another animal to man. And that, and that zoonotic transmission is, is enhanced by dirty conditions, unhygienic conditions in the, mar in the markets and illegal trade. And I think that that is, again, uh, something that the uh, governments in the, relative, in the relevant um, jurisdictions need to be looking at. We've seen a lot of change in Hong Kong in, the, in terms of the hygiene, particularly around the sale of chickens because of things like bird flu. So I think it's the wild animal trade that needs, uh, does need a much more um, rigorous regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And the other parts of that, qu uh, Alex, question then in relation to the the uh, or values in, or sorry, the immunity value being low across Europe. Yeah. Well, that, sorry, it's Martin again. So that takes us back to this issue of we we. We don't know how many people who are infected uh, go on to develop the antibodies. There is some evidence that people who had very mild symptoms may not, as I think Anthony mentioned early, earlier. So that could be one factor. But the other factor almost certainly is that countries have actually imposed social and physical distancing. And as a result, they have uh, interrupted transmission. Anthony mentioned how we could have been up in the millions of cases very easily. And the fact that we are not shows just how effective what has been done has been. So I think what has uh, happened is that the pandemic has been controlled to some extent. If we look at other parts of the world, like the Amazonian part of Brazil, where we're seeing going completely out of control, we can just see how uh, there is a real danger here. But this brings us back to the point that there's still big gaps in our knowledge. But I think that it does suggest that the idea of herd immunity, which m many of us think was never a good idea, um, was uh, is even less of a good idea. And in fact, uh, Dr. Tedros, the Director General of WHO, and, and uh, Mike Ryan, who advises him, uh, Mike in particular, were absolutely scathing about this in the press conference in WHO the other day. Thank you. Uh, the last question, I think, was about the death level. Right? How can we get to the bottom of the actual figures? That was down for me. Sorry, was that, I, I just missed that. About the level of death, uh, did you say? Yeah, you, you, you sort of were um, saying they were considerably higher than what we know, um, which would tend to agree. And I was wondering how we could actually get to the bottom of what the actual figures are. Well, the... You know, the data is presented uh, in the daily press conferences until recently, largely made up just of reports from hospitals, which of course is quite easy to collect. But the Office for National Statistics collects data much more rigorously, but they are usually two to three weeks behind um, because people have to report cases from care homes, from the community. They need to be registered. I mean, actually, you can sometimes be a month or more before you'll get the final death toll. So what the Financial Times have done is looked at the patterns of those care homes and community deaths and projected them forward 
with a reasonable projection. And so they're saying that at the moment they think just over 60,000 people will have died right up to today on their mixture of what's been reported from uh, hospitals and the ONS and a projection forward. The figures that are presented in the daily press conference are largely hospital and some care home figures up until about three weeks ago. Could I just I jump in? We will get that. Yep. Can I jump in quickly on that? Because I think uh, in our independent stage report, we were very clear that uh, we should be looking at the excess mortality, seasonally adjusted excess mortality. Yep. Uh, because even if that includes cases, some cases that are not due to COVID uh, directly, but maybe the indirect causes, like people not going to hospital for heart attacks or whatever, it still is the best measure. And if we look across Europe as the financial, t- as the economist in this case has done, you can see that in Germany, the excess, the COVID, the cases that are attributed to COVID make up 97% of that excess mortality. In France, it's 93%, but in the UK, it's only 54%. Netherlands does even worse, it's 51%. And uh, I think that links to the issue on testing. It does strongly suggest that a lot of the excess mortality in the UK is almost certainly due to COVID, but is not being uh, attributed to it. Okay, thank you. Um, I have three members left now to speak. If I could maybe ask each of the three members to ask you a key question, maybe first. Just um, so I'm going to Orlea, please. Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. My um, question to the panel is. Um, apologies, there's an echo coming back at me here. So, um, what practical mechanisms could be put in place across the island um, in the short, medium, or long term to help battle this virus? Thank you, Orlea. So, uh, panel, please. Panel, just before, just before I take your answer to that, can I check with you? Are you able to stay on for another few minutes to give members that little bit of extra time? What, what way are you fixed? No problem. Yeah, yeah I think I'm okay, but not for too long. Yeah. Okay, I pr- appreciate that. So we'll come back to you with a second question then, Orlea, and, and appreciate the panel going that extra effort. So Orlea's question then was to refresh: What measures could we be looking at across the island to deal with the with the pandemic, short term, medium term, and longer term? Well, maybe I'll just. No, Anthony, do you want to jump in there? Or? <laughs> well, go. I mean, I think just the, what, what, what we've been saying is that we everything that we do as we move ahead uh, should be with a clear intention to keep the R value down below one, recognizing all the limitations that we discussed about how you actually measure that. Um, but uh, we, I think, just have to have coordination. Uh, there is, I know there's been some debate in the Republic of Ireland about clusters of cases around the border, uh, and I haven't been able to look in sufficient detail to know exactly what is going on there, but I think just to have clear coordination. Um, if you look at the European Commission's document on lifting the lockdown, they've been very clear about the need for coordination, and of course they have a number of other examples that which are quite analogous. Uh, the, 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 the city of Gorica, Nova Gorica, in the, the Italian Slovenian border, where the border goes down the middle of the main square, which is a little bit like being in Petigo, I guess. Um, so uh, it, it, it just is a nonsense to have one thing, one set of rules in one part of jurisdiction and another set in the other, particularly where people are actually walking across a bridge or walking across a border um, every day. Uh, but the principles are the same. We just need to break the transmission chain, and that means a combination of um, distancing and, and all of those things, and testing and tracing and isolating. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, the reason I emphasize, and WHO and everyone else emphasizes, find, test, trace, and isolate, is because we want to suppress the virus, not just manage it. We obviously want to save lives by preventing cases. And most important, we want to get the economy going again because the economic impacts of this are enormous and a depression would be a catastrophe for most people. So if we can get a sustainable fine test trace isolate policy, and by that I mean one that brings in the strengths of our islands, which is a primary care service, a public health service, joined up professional people that really are committed to this. That's why I've been very critical of the situation in England, 
where it's been verticalized, over-centralized, and a lot of local authorities have been very confused about what they're supposed to be doing. So if we can get that sustainable service, and I think Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland have done well in this regard, um, I think you then in a position where you can be like the Asian states, as Sean has said, you are going to face new little outbreaks, either from imported cases or from community transmission starting up. But if you get it right suppressed, you can jump on those quite quickly. And that's what Korea have been doing with this latest outbreak in a club. Um, that's what China are doing. Uh, all of the states are keeping an eagle eye with a surveillance system. But we have to get our cases down lower than they are now before we really lift the lockdown. Thank you. Uh, Orlea, do you have a second question? Uh, yes, um, yes, thanks, Chair. Sure. And that actually leads me on to what my, the topic of my next question was. On this issue around the, the measures that were taken to suppress the virus as opposed to just managing it, um, it's already been covered about the decision, obviously, the contact tracing, um, the decision was ceased here in the north of Ireland on the 12th of March also. Um, and I know it's been mentioned a few times that that, that could have been a decision that has possibly cost legs. So I wanted to ask, the department has told us that um, the development here locally in the testing strategy, the developments have continued since the start of the pandemic, but particularly through the month of April due to an increase in capacity. So in your opinion, can a lack of capacity or demand within the market, could those things be used as viable reasons for having a slow, evolving testing approach, um, as opposed to what were, what were needed and what the World Health Organization um, has been calling for consistently. Thank you, Ornea. Across the panel, please. Who wants to pick up on that? Uh, well, Chair, uh, there was a bit of, quite a bit of an echo on the line yes. as I was getting it. So yes. I just wondered if you could maybe summarise that and repeat it, because it was difficult to follow. Just uh, I think to summarise it was that, that the, uh, the department here said that there was alternative strategies to test, trace and isolate throughout the month of April and that uh, there was a delay in, in, in rolling out those strategies. Um, so is that, is that the case or is, is test, trace and isolate kind of the, the gold standard? I think that was the question. Well, I would say bread and butter epidemiology. I, so I don't know what they were. I, I, I mean, I don't have enough information as to what their alternatives were, but it, it should be absolutely standard. Just to say, there has recently been a paper um, published by the London School of Hygiene um, with two or three members of the SAGE committee, actually, who were on that paper, where they analysed um, the impact or, or the uh, model the different types of approaches, whether mass testing or manual local testing, contact tracing. And they found that the manual local testing approach was the best at reducing the R, and that just mass testing uh, run by, you know, an independent company or something didn't actually reduce the R. So I think the evidence that we have from the testing supports that view, but certainly based on WHO evidence, and I must pay tribute to Mike Ryan and his colleagues because these people spend their whole life hunting viruses. And I think Mike Ryan is an absolute, uh, well, he is a tribute to Irish good sense, and he's been extremely articulate in promoting the WHO um, uh, principles. Thank you. And in, in relation to that, that around mass testing and manual local testing, do you, is that in reverence, is that tracing, the, the, the tracing techniques that are employed? Yeah, it's that, it's that basically you have a joined up system. And I passionately believe that this must involve primary care, GP, public health. And then if you need additional help in the intense part of it, you bring in the, the help from contact tracers, but you don't make that separate because once you fragment the system, it's not going to be joined up because ultimately you want to isolate all cases and contacts. That's the best form of social distancing. Then you isolate maybe 10% of your country and 90% get back to work. But a national lockdown is a disaster because it locks down almost all of us. 
So that's why it's so important to get the details right and to get it locally trusted and sustainable. Yeah, and maybe it goes back to the third, uh, the third point that I made in my initial presentation, that we actually need to have, you know, somebody needs to sit down with a very large sheet of paper and put on it all of the elements that need to come together and be clear about who, who does it. I think one of the concerns about what has happened in England is that for, and I, I don't want to go look backwards because that's not helpful at this stage, but there has been a tendency each time there is a problem to find a large um, outsourcing or consultancy company to go to and say, solve our problem for us. And of course, they tend to take the very simplistic solutions, and that's not what's needed. This is a complex problem, which I, you know, which would, which really will benefit from longest from established links. For example, as we used to have in England between the regional health authorities and the district health authorities, but which have now gone. But I don't want to go backwards in this. Um, but just having the idea that you can go to a, a you know, a vertical standalone program for testing is the same mistake that we've been making in development in, you know, in Africa or in Asia for, for decades, where you just think you've got one solution and you don't embed it in the local context. Thank you. Um, moving across now to back on the phone to Pat Sheehan. Pat, are you there? Yes, thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks to the panel for the presentations. Um, one of the frustrations that many of us here have is that we can't interrogate the scientific evidence or advice. So, for example, when we ask why uh, community testing and contact tracing was stopped here on March the 12th, we're told that it was guided by expert scientists actively working in the field, or that it was based on expert scientific analysis and on sound public health considerations. So those of us who aren't scientists uh, have been watching this uh, virus since it uh, started out in China. We've seen a tsunami progressing across the planet. Uh, and in contrast to the lack of transparency here, we see advice from the WHO. Uh, we also see international best practice in places like Hong Kong uh, and South Korea. And I suppose my question has a couple of parts. Uh, do, do, do you agree that the decision on March the 12th was based on uh, 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 best um, public health considerations? And um, there's also the question then of what was done uh, across the water, whether it should also have been done here, because we discovered during the course of the Brexit uh, debate for quite a number of years that many ways we were an afterthought and uh, no consideration was really given to the unique circumstances here on the island of Ireland. Now, and just one other uh, issue that I wanted to bring up as well. I mean, I, I acknowledge the argument that where there's widespread community transmission of the virus, the testing and tracing may be difficult. However, if we look to South Korea, and there was a very interesting documentary on Channel 4 last night that you were part of, Anthony, um, that when they initially thought they had the virus under control, and then there was a major outbreak in uh, a city, I think it was Daegu, it was called, a city of two million people. And they realized that they were being overwhelmed by the, the, the numbers of community transmission. But they didn't stop testing and tracing in the whole country. They sort of uh, suspended it in Daegu and continued uh, in the rest of the country. So was there not an argument for that approach to be taken uh, on March the 12th? Thank you, Pat. And over to our panel then, who'd like to start out on that? Well, I, I'm quite happy to have a go at that. In answer to your question, no, I don't think it was based on the best scientific advice, because the view of science on that committee was largely around modelling, virology, behavioural science. And they did not have a public health voice. And they didn't have an independent public health voice or voices. And they didn't consult with Korea, with Hong Kong, with Singapore, or Chinese scientists. I, as far as I'm aware, I mean, remember, we don't have the minutes. We don't know what was discussed in a lot of these meetings. But I think, it, you know, maybe it's with retrospective scope, but clearly the decision that they took was not correct 
in my opinion. On the, on the question of is Northern Ireland an afterthought, well, that's a political judgment. Um, I passionately believe in devolution when it comes to public health and making sure that everything is geared to the local context, as Martin has said. Yeah, could I just intervene, just recall what happened in 1996, because we wrote about it at the time, and that was when the Ulster Farmers Union called for a separate BSE status for Northern Ireland, and it was a time of direct rule. Uh, Baroness Denton, who uh, at that time in the, the Conservative government was in the, um, Northern, the Northern Ireland office, and was arguing passionately for that, but was overruled by her colleagues in the same government, uh, and uh, Northern Ireland was treated the same. Now, I don't want to get into the politics of it, particularly because I am from Northern Ireland, uh, but uh, I think uh, that should have reminded us that there are certainly differences. There have been long recognized to be differences in animal health, so therefore it's not surprising that we should think that perhaps we should look at differences in human health too. Thank you. Um, and I'm coming in now to Alan. Could I, could I just come back in with a short one there, Colin? No, go ahead, Pat. Okay. Uh, it, it just, just in terms of the, of the question uh, of the uneven spread of the virus and where there's widespread uh, community transmission, the, the issue of sealing off one particular part of a, of a, of a region or a country uh, and continuing on with testing and tracing in the other parts. Uh, just, I wonder, could the, could the panel comment on that? And, and just the second part of that is that even when community uh, testing and tracing stopped, why did it not resume immediately once the lockdown began? I'll pick up the first one. First of all, there are clear precedents because there have been significant restrictions and movements between the mainland and the Scottish islands. Uh, so it was impossible to get to islands like Mull and uh, to the Shetlands and so on, unless you had a very good reason to be there. So that has happened. And if we look, at, uh, interna look internationally, Italy is a very good example where the restrictions were imposed on movement from the four northern regions of Veneto, Emilia, Romagna, Lombardy and Piedmont. And uh, now when we look at the excess mortality, they were the only four regions where that has now exceeded 50%. Uh, in the other parts of Italy, it hasn't. So they were able to, uh, with the 20 Italian regions, effectively, uh, if we take that as the measure of control, control the epidemic in four out of the and limit it to four out of the 20 regions, whereas if we take the, seven, the 12 standard regions of the UK, which Northern Ireland, one Scotland, another Wales, and then the English regions, then you can see that that value has been exceeded in seven out of the 12. Uh, so there has been much less um, success in limiting it. Now, of course, I can see there are difficulties in preventing people moving from the West Midlands to uh, the Northwest, but, but they did it in Italy. They also did it in, yeah. sorry, they also did it in Korea with a partial lockdown, as you know, in two of the 18 provinces. Uh, they've done it in Singapore, locking down um, certain parts of their city-state where there was outbreaks. And indeed, the government are now talking about future partial lockdowns if things are getting out of control in certain areas or not. Uh, I think on March the 12th, that was a debate that they could have had about locking down London, everyone within the M25, and possibly parts of the Midlands. Uh, I'm in rural East Yorkshire right now, and we've heard of very few cases up here. And certainly at the time of lockdown, I think there were less than 10 cases in the entire state or, or district of um, East Riding, which is about three and a half, 350,000 people. So it was an option. Um, but on the other hand, there were political considerations to get the seriousness when they had to do it on the 23rd. That probably did require a national response. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm aware that uh, two of our, our contributors this morning uh, serve on the independent uh, SAGE group. Uh, so I, I'm going to come at this maybe as a, the devil's advocate uh, and ask, uh, why was it sort of felt necessary to form uh, an alternative uh, SAGE group, which is seen as being in uh, competition uh, to the official SAGE group? 
uh, which is widely regarded uh, to have the best scientific minds in the land. Uh, does the independent sage group accept uh, that by publicly undermining uh, those scientific minds and efforts, they are perhaps, in fact, uh, undermining the scientific and medical minds that are trying harder than anyone else to actually save lives. And just make a comment that SAGE, the official SAGE, would have access uh, to all the latest data, uh, both public and not. Uh, and whereas I would assume that the self-appointed alternative SAGE group would only have access to a data field that would be significantly more narrow. And, and in conclusion, could I ask the three panel members, do they all fully support uh, all the actions and statements made by the World Health Organization to date in relation to this crisis? Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And who in the panel wants to start on that? Perhaps I should start. Um, just to say that, first of all, science is always about debate. And in a complex situation like this, it's going to be about open discussion and transparency. And that was why Sir David King was so concerned that he felt there should be an independent, not an alternative stage, an independent one that would particularly focus on the weaknesses of SAGE because they didn't have many public health or social science voices. Um, it, and, and, and we wanted to do it in an open way to discuss many of these problems. Um, we don't know how long it will last. You're absolutely right. There are some fine scientific minds on the, the main stage. But I would argue that the definition of science goes beyond behavioral science, virology, and mathematical modeling, that actually public health is the primary science, population science, that you need to involve in this epidemic that social scientists, uh, people who have expertise in BME issues, which is a, a much bigger problem in England than Northern Ireland, and uh, many other representatives, uh, having that open debate will be constructive. In our report, we have been totally constructive. We've sent it to the chief scientific advisor. We've sent it to the CMO, who's indicated uh, he approves of many of the suggestions. And we haven't looked back. Uh, in a way that was critical. We tried to make positive contributions. Yeah, I, I really want to refute absolutely the idea that we are in any sort of competition. First of all, there is a, number, there is a degree of overlap in our membership. Some members of the official stage are also in the independent stage. We talk, many of us as individuals, talk to senior officials on a regular basis. And um, this is absolutely meant to be constructive. Uh, it is not in any way seeking to undermine anybody. And actually, that's a very serious allegation to make. And I, I personally take it very, I, I find it almost offensive, in fact, that we would be trying to do that. I, I think that I was talking about public perception of, of what you're doing. I am, of course, we are aware that there have been a number of attacks on us, which are in a number of cases, and in my own case, factually inaccurate. And in fact, one of the individuals concerned had to correct uh, what they said. But uh, no, uh, this is not a competition. This is meant to be constructive, and both, there are both formal and informal mechanisms for ensuring that we do discuss our work and what we're thinking with, um, with people who are in more official positions. Uh, but I think we really need to put this one to bed because it is simply not true. And, and why would we? Just, just one other yes, Anthony, go ahead. thing is about, I feel actually quite sorry for many of the scientists on official stage. Most of them are very happy to give their names. Most of them would be very happy to see all the uh, minutes release of their discussions and you've seen in the way the press targeted uh, Professor Ferguson in a way that I thought was entirely inappropriate and unfair um, that people are you know my worry about this is that when we come to a public inquiry it's going to be all about blame shifting on to individual scientists on stage and that should not be the case um, we are trying to add value to an extremely complex uh, national crisis. Thank you. Um, listen, I want to really thank the panel in terms of how long you have, how long you have contributed to this meeting, the, the evidence and the experience and the knowledge you have brought. 
When we initially agreed that we wanted to, to uh, schedule a session like this, what exactly what we asked for was around that same issue of debate. We wanted to inform ourselves based on the best evidence that we could, could find from across the world and from across other pandemics, how we could inform and educate ourselves so that we can play our role in terms of scrutinising, in terms of advising the Department of Health, and I think that's valid. And I think you have all contributed hugely to that effort this morning, and I would like to thank you for your attendance here and to wish you all the very best in the days ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Members, we now, we now would need to take a short break in order to get the second panel onto the phone lines. Um, I propose we come back at 10 past 12. Thank you. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This. OK, members, thank you for returning and we will now resume our meeting. Um, can I advise members that officials are here today in relation to our work on COVID-19. Officials from RQAA are here today to brief the committee on the role of the RQAA during the pandemic. I would like to welcome Ms. Mr. Dermot Parsons, Interim Chief Executive, Ms. Emer Hopkins, Interim Director of Improvement, and Ms. Elaine Connolly, Assistant Director, Assurance. And could I ask members who are not speaking if you could place your phone on mute 
That will help with uh, reducing the, the static and interference in the room. And I would now like to go ahead and invite RQIA to make a presentation to the committee. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today in relation to RQIA's role as part of the wider health and social care response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Firstly, on behalf of RQIA, I would want to extend our sympathy to all of those whose lives have been directly impacted by COVID-19. I would also want to commend staff working across health and social care, including our own dedicated staff team, who are working tirelessly to ensure safety and well-being of those in receipt of care. RQIA is Northern Ireland's health and social care regulator, responsible for the registration and inspection of almost 1,500 care services across Northern Ireland. On the 20th of March, as part of the health and social care response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and to minimise the risk of spreading infection to the most vulnerable people in society, the Department of Health directed RQIA to step down its regular inspection programme. This is consistent with the approach of health and social care regulators across the UK and Ireland, including TQC and HICWA. While our routine inspection programme paused, RQIA can assure the public that our team of inspectors, including registered nurses, social workers and pharmacists, continue to regulate health and social care services and to respond to any specific safety concerns in these services. During this time, RQIA has continued to respond to concerns in regulated care services and, where necessary, we've taken enforcement action. We've continued to monitor HSC Trust's statutory duty quality. We continue to undertake our duties under the Mental Health Order and under the IRMA legislation governing radiation services, and we continue to support medical governance in independent hospitals through our responsible officer role. Following the declaration of the pandemic, Dr. Michael McBride, Chief Medical Officer, also repurposed our QIA to provide enhanced support to health and social care services. This change reflected the recognition that the threat to safety and quality of provision for residents posed by COVID-19 was the greatest safety threat at that time, and one that requires new specific guidance that would be unfamiliar for providers. With a team of around 40 inspectors available at any one time, our regulatory response always involves judgment about where we intervene at a particular time. In this situation, the deployment of RQIA staff has reflected prioritization of COVID-19 work as the highest risk priority. Over the past six weeks, RQIA on behalf of the Department of Health and Public Health Agency, has issued the latest regional direction and guidance on a range of issues crucial to the safe management of care homes, domiciliary care services, and independent hospitals and hospices during the pandemic. We have issued over 150 separate pieces of guidance to services, many of which have been lengthy documents, which have focused on PPE and dress code, human resources and staffing arrangements, testing, medicines management, palliative care, training resources, and comprehensive care home guidance. This guidance, as I say, is detailed, and key elements changed and evolved as the pandemic has developed. On a twice daily basis, on behalf of the Department of Finance Procurement Branch, RQA has published details of PPE suppliers to support providers in sourcing additional supplies. In March, we established a service support team made up of inspectors and senior staff to provide advice and direction to nursing homes, residential care homes and domiciliary care services in managing their services during this particularly challenging time, in line with the latest guidance from the Department of Health and the Public Health Agency. We also developed and introduced a smartphone app which allowed services to directly contact our service support team. During this time, RQA has moved to be a seven-day-a-week, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., single point of contact support for care homes and domiciliary care agencies. The RQA support, though, has been far from being a call centre service. Our expert inspectors have provided focused and professional guidance based on their understanding and experience of the sector to support good quality care provision and IPC practice in care homes regionally. Since late March, 
there have been around 3,000 contacts, telephone calls and emails between services and our service support team. Around three quarters of these have involved care homes, with the remainder from domiciliary care services, including supported living services. This is an unprecedented level of contact with homes. Around 60% of those contacts are from services seeking advice or wishing to share information with us, while 40% have involved RQIA proactively contacting services in response to intelligence or to offer support and guidance. Through this work, we have played a major role in embedding this guidance across the sector to support good practice. In the initial phase of the pandemic, much of this contact related to PPE and COVID testing arrangements. But recently, key issues have included infection prevention and control, staffing challenges, and issues around visitors to services. Much of our contact with providers has been highly focused. In early April, our QIA inspectors contacted every care home and domiciliary care service to offer support and to provide details on how to contact us to access this support and guidance. Over Easter weekend, we contacted some 400 providers to check how they were dealing with the situation at that time and to offer specific assistance. In late April, our inspectors contacted domiciliary care services to provide advice on donning and doffing PPE when entering and leaving clients' homes and on the correct PPE for supported living services. Over the past week, our inspectors have phoned all nursing and residential care homes not experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak to risk assess their preparedness and to offer support. This week, we've started a program of visits to services where inspectors are providing advice and guidance on infection prevention and control practices. In addition, throughout this time, we continue to receive calls through our duty desk, where an RQIA inspector responds to calls from service providers, care staff, and concerned family members. We've had calls directed to the named inspector for services and emails from providers and the public. A critical point, it's important to recognize we have not stopped inspecting. Where we have become aware of risk, we have reacted as usual. We've made risk-related inspections as necessary. We have, for example, carried out inspections in our now three care homes where there were significant COVID-19 outbreaks. We still do not hesitate to take enforcement action where appropriate. Yesterday, we issued a failure to comply notice to a service where a whistleblower revealed that the service, despite assurances to us, was not using PPE safely to protect service users and staff. In the last fortnight, on behalf of the Department for Health, we've introduced a further reporting app for care homes. On a daily basis, this app gathers information about the health status of residents, also, sadly, deaths and staff. This aims to ease the burden on care homes previously reporting to different public bodies. It has also allowed our QA to provide information to the Department, Public Health Agency, Trusts and Board to inform regional responses alongside the trust support and our QIA support to individual homes. Now, we recognise that COVID-19 infection is, sadly, likely to be present in care homes for some period of time. So we're adjusting to that reality and the need for an increase in the level of assurance on what could be called the normal types of risk in social care. Consistent with other health and social care regulators in the UK and Ireland, we're preparing to adjust to this changed state for the imminent future. We're currently liaising with the Department of Health to agree an inspection approach still consistent with the Chief Medical Officer's guidance on reducing footfall in homes, which is achievable in an environment where homes are facing additional challenges, and this is likely to rely on increased use of technology. We continue to support these services to make risk assessed and evidence-based decisions using their professional judgment and their knowledge and understanding of the people in their care. And as always, the safety and well-being of everyone in receipt of health and social care services across Northern Ireland is of paramount importance to our QIA. We continue our regulation activities to ensure that management arrangements are robust and in the best interests of those receiving care. Okay, thank you, Dermot. Um, thank you for that presentation. I will uh, start off with a couple of questions myself. I'll then go to the members on the phone. 
in the order in the order in which they phoned in, and then I'll, I'll then come to members in the rooms in the room for questions and answers, please. So you mentioned there at the, at the outset of your briefing, Dermot, that the Department of Health advised RQIA to suspend inspections. Um, who took the actual decision to suspend those, given that given that you're an independent regulator? Who who made the decision? Okay, I, I suppose to, to, to clarify that, um, th this was uh, not a suspension of inspections. Uh, we were directed by the department under their powers to issue directions to our QIA uh, to reduce our statutory uh, inspection frequency. It, it is not a cessation or suspension of inspections. Okay, and did you agree? Did you what, did you challenge or agree with that uh, that approach? Uh, our approach towards that was agreement. I mean, there had been discussion with the department before uh, the issue of the direction to us about what appeared to be the most significant risks in the sector at the time, and discussion about how our QIA could best use its resources to support. I suppose, the response to the biggest threat that exists in care homes at that point. Okay. In relation then to the PPE that you have, you have indicated that you played a key role in, in terms of PPE, given that there was a very clear failure to provide care homes with PPE at the critical time and in the quantities and of the quality that was required, um, what's your assessment of how that failure came about? And what lessons have been learnt to prevent any um, reoccurrence of that of that error? Well, I suppose going back to uh, the first part of your question, there, um, our QIS role has not been in providing PPE from the very start. Our role has been uh, to, uh, I suppose, get the guidance that has been produced from the PHA, ensure that it was circulated in the sector and try and embed good practice with providers around PPE. Uh, in the early part of our work with the service support team, we did find there were a significant number of issues where providers were reporting difficulty uh, in getting hold of PPE. And where there were those challenges, we reported that back to the trusts, uh, back to, through the sort of senior, appropriate senior networks, depending on the nature of the problem, to ensure that the, the issue was resolved. The other element that we have done around that, as I was describing in my presentation, we, we wrote out to providers and made them aware of a place on our website that was not publicly available and provide them with um, sort of access code details for that, where they could access um, information that had been provided from the Department of Finance about are currently available sources of PPE that they might wish to order. Uh, in the early part of the pandemic, uh, that resource seemed to be regularly and heavily accessed by providers. Currently, the usage of that resource has dropped very heavily to, uh, I think the last report was, it's down to single figures per day now, which would indicate that providers are now being able to source PPE from other routes. Okay, and, and as regulator, can you assure this committee that the that the issue of PPE it, it, at the present time and in the weeks ahead has been addressed satisfactorily and the staff will be protected? Uh, it's not entirely our role to be able to give you that assurance. I mean, what, what we can assure you at this point is uh, we are not hearing back from providers at this point about the challenges they were having accessing it previously. Uh, the, the issue about future availability, we, we don't know about that. And would you be concerned, therefore, Dermot? At not, no, at not knowing, at not knowing. And when, I, when I say staff protected, of course, residents also are protected through the proper use and provision of PPE. Well, so, what we can say is we know that in accordance with the regional guidance, it is crit critically important that the correct PPE is available for use by staff, for the protection of the service users and for staff themselves. Uh, I would not expect that RQIA would have information about arrangements for future supply. Okay, I'm going to go to members now. So I'm, I'm going to the phone first for this session um, and I'm going first to Alex Easton. Alex, are you there? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, question please, Alex. Just one question that's 
really been worrying me. Um, the, the vast majority of deaths seem to be now in, in nursing homes and residential homes. Um, why, why is it that those residents aren't being taken to hospital and admitted there? Um, are, are they being advised to be treated in the nursing home? Is there, is, is there any reasoning that you know about that? Okay, and over to the panel, please, for a response. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, it certainly is the case that uh, in some situations, uh, people living in care homes who uh, have a COVID-19 infection are continuing to live and be supported in the place they live in, and in other people who have those infections are, are receiving care in hospital. I mean, that really is on the basis of individual professional assessments about the best way to provide care to those individuals. Uh, I, I do not think that is r related to any particular policy position. Now, in, in terms of, uh, I suppose, the, the, the impact that has on reporting in the situation, uh, I, I think that point was alluded to yesterday by the Commissioner for Older People in his observation that uh, information about people who sadly die is divided between information about people who may die in a care home and people who die in hospital. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's particularly something that has engaged the regulator. Okay, thank you. And uh, yes, going moving moving on then to Arlea. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, I would just like to ask: When um, do you plan to restart your regular inspections? Um, I know that you have been carrying out um, risk rated ones you mentioned, and also enforcement when necessary. Um, but I suppose the context that we're in at the moment with the car homes, um, I suppose there's there's many of them that would fall into that, um, you know, that risk related um, category. So just do you plan on um, reverting back to the regular in inspections? And could you maybe just detail then some of the statistics? That, so how many um, risk related inspections have been carried out um, and some of the reasons for any of the enforcement that have been put in place? Thank you. Okay. Hello, please. Um, can I ask members? There's, there's a noise there. A strange, I'm not sure whether it's a, something scraping on a table, or, or a, but there's a, a noise there. Could could all members who aren't speaking please ensure your phone is muted when you're not speaking? Thank you. And I'll go then to uh, Dermot for a response to Arlea, please. Okay. Uh, I think the date at which we would be able to. Uh, reinstate an inspection program similar to the one we had before is probably some way off. And that relates to the nature, I suppose, of COVID-19. And if I, if I can illustrate that to you, um, during a, a normal inspection program at this time of year, we would be expecting that an individual inspector might inspect uh, two homes per week. So um, during, I suppose, during the 14-day period in which a COVID-19 in, uh, infection could be incubating, that could take an inspector to four separate homes. And I think consistent with the guidance there is from the chief medical officer, I don't think any of us would be comfortable uh, to be carrying out inspections that involve inspectors going into homes and talking to people at close distance in these current circumstances. The, the public health advice is also suggesting to us that for a considerable period of time, there will continue to be a considerable cohort of homes where there is a COVID-19 infection present. And we need to make sure that the actions of our inspectors do not run the risk of being vectors for infection. And in some instances where there is acute inspection, infection, sorry, uh, it could be a, a, a impossible to carry out the kind of inspection that we normally carry out because of the nature of the care being provided under pressure. At this point, consistent with other regulators, and I mean, I join a regular call with the regulators from UK and Ireland, we are trying to develop an alternative approach to gaining assurance, which probably relies less heavily on actual footfall in the homes for a regular inspection program, while continuing to um, go on site into services where there is a 
suggestion of practices that could be placing people at risk from unsafe care. Uh, currently, uh, we do not think there is a value in automatically inspecting homes simply because there is a COVID-19 outbreak, because it may be being managed perfectly well in accordance with good professional guidance. Uh, you were asking about inspections that we've done to date. Um, I mean, just thinking about the most recent ones we have done, uh, we had two inspections carried out uh, late yesterday evening, uh, which were both in relation to um, allegations about, sorry, concerns really about uh, possible poor practice uh, related to COVID-19. And thankfully, the concerns that were raised were, were, were not substantiated on inspection. Uh, we have two inspections underway today, uh, one in a nursing home, one in a residential care home, again, where we're pursuing issues around uh, practice that's related to safe care with COVID-19. Uh, you asked about the enforcement we've taken. Uh, we've, I mean, uh, we've issued one failure to comply notice this week, and as I was saying, the issue there was uh, around safe use of PPE uh, and the practice we found was contrary to the assurances that we had been given by the provider. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Earlier. Uh, now moving to Pat. Are you there, Pat? I am indeed, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, just a couple of short questions. <clears throat> the, the, the first one, I want to know if the inspections being stopped relate only, the direction from the department relates only to care homes, or does it also relate to places like Muckamore Abbey? Uh, and secondly, I have been lobbied by a number of care homes who, in the context of the pandemic, have had to rely heavily on agency staff. Uh, and I'm wondering what the RQIA are doing to ensure that agency staff are not moving from one home to another and inadvertently introducing the virus to homes they're moving about in. Thank you. Thank you. And over to our panel, please. Okay. Uh, I suppose uh, I, I'm, I'm going to ask my colleagues to pick up on the first part of your question, but just deal with the, the second part. The, the guidance that there is from the Chief Medical Officer uh, discourages um, sort of excess footfall in homes and I suppose our work with the SEC, we have been encouraging homes to maintain as stable a staff team as possible, to draw on their own bank staff where possible, but the reality is in the course of the pandemic, our people's staff teams have become weakened and depleted and there have been situations and continue to be situations where there is reliance on agency staff. So there is Clearly, the idea is to consolidate regular booking of agency staff for particular homes to create stability. Uh, and I suppose the key to it all, whatever staff are coming into a home, wherever they're coming from, they require to comply with the good infection control procedures that have been recommended by the PHA, and that's what we're working on with providers. Now, I'm going to ask Ema Hopkins to pick up on the first part of your question. So in relation to the other kind of non-care home inspections that we would normally carry out, um, the, the direction that we were given by the department allowed us the ability to make judgments about where we have areas of concern and particularly where there was ongoing enforcement or escalation action where we already had intelligence to suggest that there was a role for us. So we did indeed over the last six weeks we undertake evaluations and for want of an, another word desktop type inspections we were able to evaluate compliance with improvement notices in the northern ireland ambulance service and we were able to um, undertake very very close scrutiny and judgment in relation to following up in terms of the improvement notices at Muckamore Abbey Hospital. And we continue to keep very, very close and continued engagement with those services. So whilst we are able to undertake inspections, we have, to this point, been able to get the assurance that we need through a range of other means. I suppose, Emer, if you don't mind me interrupting, 
Uh, I suppose the reason I brought this up is because uh, something like 27 members of staff in Muckamore have tested positive for COVID-19 over the past couple of weeks. And I'm wondering, would that not prompt uh, concern in RQIA about that level of infection uh, and the concern that uh, this might spread to some very vulnerable patients who are in Muckamore? Yes, thank, thank you, Pat. I mean, fortunately, we have very um, good information coming to us from the trust in respect of patients in Buckingham who have very small, small numbers tested positive, and we have scrutinised the management, the isolation, and the cohorting of those patients. And we have reviewed the figures in terms of the numbers of positive staff, and we are not at this point concerned about that. But as always, this is a very vulnerable group of people, and that we will continue to want to be assured that the best practice is being adhered to. And were we not assured, we would not hesitate in, in visiting the site in a safe way. Okay, thank you, Emer. Um, going now to Colin. Thank you very much indeed, sir, and thank you to the panel for um, their uh, presentation. Can I just clarify, um, just to begin with, when you stepped down your inspection programme, what date that was? Well, I suppose, again, I want to be clear, the inspection programme is not stepped down. We are continuing to do inspections. Our routine inspection programme uh, was directed to be reduced by the Chief Medical Officer on the 20th of March. And on receipt of a direction from the Chief Medical Officer, uh, essentially we took that step immediately. Okay, thank you for that, Dermot. I used the term step down program uh, because they are your words that you wrote to me on the 24th of April. Okay, yeah. So it didn't step down? Well, in terms of step down, it has been reduced. I suppose I was concerned in the way you're putting that question that there could be a suggestion that we have ceased inspecting because we have not ceased inspecting. We have uh, basically uh, reduced our routine program. So, I mean, our routine program is stepped down. Our inspections overall are not stepped down. Right, okay, well, the letter was certainly quite clear about it, but I'll, I'll take your word on it now. You, you've mentioned that you conducted in the process that you have attended two inspections in homes and that both of those have been in the last week. Is that correct? Uh, no. I, I described um, inspections that have happened in the last couple of days. Uh, we have in the... Uh, I mean, we, we've done more inspections than that over the time. I think we've done here, I'm just counting, uh, we've done 12 care home inspections in the last... Um, the last in the last few weeks, and we've done two on-site support visits, and uh, we've done a number of other engagements with homes which haven't necessarily had us crossing the threshold. So you, you have been completing inspections, you just, for the purpose of today, you just were illustrating that there were two in the past week? Uh, no, I, I didn't say there were two in the last week. Uh, there, in fact, there are two inspections going on today, and there were two inspections carried out yesterday. Okay, I think it's getting a bit confusing. I, I can't quite work out between whether you're saying that they have happened in the last couple of days, I think means that they've happened in the last week. Would that not be correct? Uh, in in the, the written statement that uh, we provided in advance, we talked about carrying out uh, inspections in two care homes that had significant COVID-19 outbreaks. Okay. Today, we have two inspectors in different homes carrying out an inspection, probably as we speak. Uh, we had two inspectors out in homes last night as well, and they are both in this week. Uh, but but if, if you like, the situation progressed in that we carried out an inspection at extremely short notice. Uh, we carried out two inspections at extremely short notice in the last 24 hours. I just want Pam as, as a supplementary to that question. Pam, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Just on the back of Colin's question, could you just clarify in terms of the inspections? Are these are all the inspections that you're referring to now, uh, say within the last month, are they all physical on-site inspections? No, they're not. Uh, 
Um, uh, a num I mean, some of them are and some of them aren't. We have uh, 12 that we've carried out in, uh, in total. Eight of them were on-site inspections and three of them were remote inspections. Okay, Colin, I'll let you back in just a yeah. wish to... Um, maybe what we'll do is afterwards we can, we can word, word it correctly, the information that we're looking for you, and then you'll be able to, to take time to come back to this because I think there's a bit of confusion even into the room as to what's an inspection and on site inspection. If you did 12, which includes 8 plus 3, that's 11 by my books, but we'll give you the opportunity to come back to this with the specific information. Do, do you maintain an at-risk or a special measures list of... Um, homes whenever you go out and inspect them that there's some sort of like there's 450 care homes uh, and that there may be some that you go out and inspect and then you sort of say look we're going to have to keep an eye here or just go back and forward do you keep like a separate list like that uh, it, it, it's probably not quite as simple as that um, so I'm just going to pick up on the, the, the confusing figure here and to be clear we had nine inspections on site three inspections that we carried out remotely and I suppose consistent with my answer to your colleague earlier, uh, in our program going forward, we know we're going to have to develop approaches to doing uh, more inspections remotely. In terms of how we normally inspect in normal time, we, we, we normally inspect according to the fees and frequencies regulations, which currently stipulate that residential homes and nursing homes should be inspected twice a year. So, if you like, we have a sort of baseline number of inspectors, inspections that we do for that purpose. Over and above that, we would inspect where we have concerns about services, which might be uh, sort of in response to things that we found in earlier inspections. It might be on the basis of information that we receive, maybe from members of the public or other professionals uh, involved in the home, and where there are concerns identified that we substantiate when we go out on an inspection. We may take enforcement action, we may take, uh, we may make identify areas for improvement and take assurance from the provider, but where we are not content that uh, a good level of provision is present, we are more likely to return again sooner, if that's uh, what you mean. Uh, we have a tool in relation to nursing homes that's been developed in association with Professor Brian Taylor from Ulster University, uh, referred to as RADAR, which helps us determine the, the, the necessary frequency of inspections to, um, to homes. Uh, and we also we have an internal IT system in which we log all the concerns that we receive about a home and where we log all the notifications that we get from homes. And obviously, uh, we, 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 we keep information about outcomes of previous inspections. I suppose there's a very, I mean, the key important professional judgment area is each of our inspectors has an individual caseload of homes. So they are required to scrutinize all the intelligence that we receive about services, be familiar with the outcomes of previous inspections, and that supports them in determining what the, the, the appropriate future inspection regime for services is. Over the past year, and I this continues to be the case now, I would say an increasing proportion of our inspections have been responsive to uh, inspections that have been triggered by concerns that have been identified to us about services, where we've gone out uh, basically on the back of concerns about people's being poor factors that might contribute to people's well-being in services. Okay, last question, just a very short question. Um, just in terms, uh, to paraphrase what you said there, that if you're not content uh, with, with uh, a, a, an inspection at home, you would then uh, line up for some special attention. Of if you stopped your, um, you stepped down your program on the 20th of March. How many of those homes that you were not content about? How many deaths has there been in them? Uh, I mean, I, I suppose to, to be clear, okay, there's, there's a difference between circumstances where we might not be content with, say, um, arrangements around management or about environment, and factors that might be linked to uh, COVID-19 or care related to COVID-19. Now, as the pandemic has uh, continued, uh, we've carried out an exercise uh, trying to see if there was a correlation between services where we've taken enforcement action and services uh, where there have been COVID-19 outbreaks. 
and we are clear that there is not a correlation between services where we have uh, taken enforcement action and services where there is a COVID-19 outbreak. Okay. Thank you. I, I think in, in common with many of the issues that we're dealing with and the organisations we're dealing with, there are further issues and as this develops there will be other things we'll be looking to come back on. Um, but for now I'm going to move on to Jerry. Carol. Thanks Chair and thanks for the presentation. And I just if, before I ask my question, if you could clarify, has there only been nine physical inspections out of 450 car rooms? Um, if you could clarify if that's the case. Um, the RQIA, uh, in conjunction with the Patient Client Council, set up a service support team uh, on the 26th of March in your headquarters. And according to the Department of Health, uh, from the 26th of March to the 30th of April, 2,434 contacts were made between the support team and service providers. Of those 2,434 contacts, uh, 15, uh, 1,500 were raised as concerns and issues. Can the panel give us examples of those uh, 1,500 concerns, what the issues were uh, in over a four-week period? And to me, it seems to be very high. And is that abnormally high for a so-called normal period? Over to the panel, please. Thank you. OK. Uh, I suppose, firstly, yes, I can confirm we've carried out nine on-site inspections during that time. And that is consistent with the guidance issued by CMO instructing us to reduce footfall in homes where possible and r respond to circumstances where there was identified risk rather than carry out our standard program. Now, in, in terms of concerns, uh, we have a module on our IT system where any contact that we have received in relation to COVID-19, we have classed as a concern. Uh, the, the kinds of matters we have been hearing from services back during this time uh, would predominantly about be clarifying matters in relation to the guidance that's been issued to the sector, which has changed during the time. In the early days, uh, around accessing PPE and the arrangements for accessing PPE, um, probably consistently throughout the time, but with probably an increase in recent times, uh, discussions around infection, uh, infection prevention and control measures, and a good number of them have been us contacting homes ourselves to go through uh, essentially a sort of checklists with them to ensure that good arrangements were in place. And I suppose predominantly staffing, and that's particularly been an issue in services where there, there, there is or has been a COVID-19 outbreak, but it's been a general issue across the sector during this time as staff availability has lessened. Just ask a follow-up question. Uh, in regards to staffing um, and also PPE items distributed to care homes, um, can the RQIA detail uh, how much that has been in terms of a figure and, and answer the question uh, who is paying for that? So could, could you repeat that at the end of the please? I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, who is paying for the PPE and the extra staff uh, being uh, submitted and uh, contributed to uh, care homes? Okay, I mean, I'm afraid in relation to who's paying for PPE and staffing, that, that's not a matter that our QA would have information about. Okay. okay, I'm going then to Paula. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my question's re relating to, you, you mentioned there that you don't hesitate to take enforcement action um, with the issue of the failure to comply notices. I'm slightly concerned about that based on the experience of Muckamore, for example, where these failure to comply notices were um, were submitted or whatever the proper term is, but it took months and months for them to actually be um, met, the conditions met. So how are you going to ensure that the enforcement action is followed through very, very quickly? And the second part really is there, a lot of the contact you'd spoken about was with the care home um, management. Um, how is the process of dealing with staff directly in terms of whistleblowers? How is that being managed as well? Thank you. Um, sorry, could you repeat the end of the last piece there? I'm afraid I couldn't quite make up the last bit. Well, it's really about how you're engaging with the, the, the staff, the frontline staff, um, even through to whistleblowers to see what their experience is, because I'm, I'm concerned that you may be hearing from the, the management that things are all going very well, but the reality of it is for the people who are having to deal with the, with the, the um, pandemic are feeling a lot more under pressure. Well, I suppose to, to take your question in different sections, uh, the, the 
failure to comply notice that we issued yesterday uh, to a service uh, actually links very, very much to the question you're asking in that the, the concern was drawn to our attention by a staff member who contacted our great whistleblow, highlighting that the practice in the service uh, was not as had been described by management, and that led us to carry out an inspection. And in fact, if staff members contact us highlighting that practice is different from what management are outlining, that is one of the things that is likely to trigger an on-site in, in inspection. In terms of how things are, are going to take to be corrected, the failure to comply notice that we issued yesterday uh, stipulates that full compliance is required by the 27th of May this year, and we will be carrying out further inspection to determine that is the case at that point. Okay, well, just to go back a bit, obviously there's been a high turnover of staff um, within the care homes, and, and to declare an interest, my daughter now works in one. Um, so there's, there's a lot of young, inexperienced people who are being put into the front line around this. How are they being advised? For I don't think a lot of them would actually know that RQIA exists. And the second part is, do you not think that 27th of May is a little bit long to um, deal with some of the issues? Uh, well, essentially, it's, four, it's 14 days from the issue of the notice. And we, we were given an assurance by the provider at the meeting that the practice would change immediately. But when we go back, we will need to talk to staff to determine what their experience has been in the intervening period so that we can verify that uh, basically that the correct practice in relation to PPE is now being followed. If we had a shorter time than that, I don't think we'd be able to gain adequate assurance that practice has changed consistently. Okay, and in relation to the other part of Paula's question as to how you're engaging with staff beyond just phoning management to find out how they're coping with the COVID crisis, how are you engaging with staff and ensuring, more importantly, the staff who have concerns are engaging with you? Well, so the, sorry, I, I should have picked up on that. The, the route for staff to engage with us, I suppose, essentially, um, we have contact arrangements for people to contact us. And we have taken hundreds of calls from managers and staff and relatives and members of the public during that time. And we're highly responsive to concerns that staff raise. We've also had contact with us uh, from uh, trade unions and other representatives of staff who have highlighted particular practice concerns that we have in each instance uh, gone back to the service or the arrangements for the service in the most appropriate way according to the nature of the concern uh, so that we could make sure the issues that were raised were dealt with. Um, I mean, last night's inspections that we carried out also involved contact that had been made with us by a person who was a whistleblower. And uh, I mean, I think the circumstances that you described around people contacting us to raise concerns which will be members of staff or members of the public associated, are highly influential with us in determining how we respond to a situation. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to Pam. Chairman. Um. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, in your presentation, you uh, say that in late April, your inspectors contacted Dom Sullery Care Service to provide advice on donning and doffing PPE when entering and leaving clients' homes. Um, late April was just over two weeks ago. Have you, uh, have you a precise date for that? And it seems very late in the day. And also, um, have you given the same support and advice to the care homes? And if so, what date would that have taken place by? Uh, yes, the, I, the, the, the guidance around that uh, is, was issued at the start of the pandemic period. And it's been... Critically, sorry, I sorry Dermot, to... Dermot, we missed the start of your answer there. Can you? Okay, sorry. It just wasn't clear. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, we have been uh, raising the issues with providers from the very start of our, our current role, and uh, the engagement with providers around appropriate use of PPE has been a key element of what the support team has been doing from the start. 
the reason that we contacted, I suppose, where we quite intentionally did a very intentional call with each of the domiciliary care agencies at that time was because we were concerned that awareness in that sector might not be as robustly embedded as it might be. And we carried out very structured discussions with those providers at that point uh, in order to reinforce the message. Uh, in particular, in relation to supported living services, uh, there was an interpretation point uh, in the guidance that had been issued by the PHA that we were very keen to make sure that the supported living providers understood the distinctions that were made in different parts of the tables of guidance that were issued at that time. Okay, and you, you mentioned uh, that you have had hundreds of calls from uh, manager, staff, relatives. Um, how, how many, would you know how many in terms of percentage of those calls are related to PPE um, provision and uh, use and knowledge of how to don and doff that PPE? Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't have a precise figure for that. I mean, we, we could sort of look at our information and we could break that down and provide it with you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. And I'm moving then to Alan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I don't know whether this question really is uh, within uh, Durham. It's an uh, area of responsibility, but uh, I'll throw it out anyway. Um, in terms, we all welcome the, the news that uh, the uh, health department are going to ramp up the amount of testing that they're going to do in the, the care home sector. Um, but do residents... Um, of the care homes uh, or nursing homes, do, do they have the right or the, their next of kin have the right to decline uh, to have the test done? And uh, would there be a number of residents uh, in the sector that simply wouldn't be fit enough, to be actually physically fit enough to be tested? Uh, I'm afraid that really a policy area that's outside the RQA remit. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really answer that one for you. That's fine. No, I thought it might be. Okay. Okay. Um, I have no other indication to this stage, but um, I just uh, one question for me, Dermot, in relation to the current the current pandemic. Um, can you describe your current relationship with the with the department and the PHA as a regulator? And are there issues around independence at the at the minute, given the given the issues that have arisen? Uh, I, I think the um, relationship with the department is just as normal, if you like. Uh, I would say there's a good information flow between ourselves and the department and the public health agency and the HSC board uh, and the trusts. Uh, I suppose the difference at this time is that the direction that Dr. McBride issued to us has temp temporarily changed the emphasis uh, within our work. But uh, we're sort of engaging with the department, as I was saying earlier, to determine how we can get back to uh, carrying out uh, a more normal regulatory regime. But that's really within the, uh, sort of the policy direction of the department to give us a further direction on that. I mean, Dr. McBride's letter refers to us being issued with a further future direction. I mean, I think it's important really to note RQA is quite a small organization and we're part of the the, sort of the, the whole region HSC response to uh, COVID-19 at the moment because it is such a huge issue and in particular such a huge challenge in the care home area. But we recognise so in working with the department that the areas of, if you want to call them, although I hate using the phrase sort of the normal concerns around social care, are still there and we need to work with them to find our way back into a regulation programme that isn't only risk responsive. Okay, thank you. And in relation to yesterday's comment by the Minister that the care home sector is not fit for purpose, what's your view of that statement given your central role in ensuring the, the fit for purpose-ness of that, of that sector? Well, I mean, I suppose all I can say to that is um, Clearly, the, the, the policy for social care provision uh, sits with Minister and with the Department. Our role is around uh, working to ensure the safety and quality of services for people supported and cared for. 
and we will continue to do that within whatever framework prevails at the time. And again, does that, does that provide a challenge to the independence of, of the regulator? If you're working within oh. a framework that's prescribed for you? Well, well I mean, essentially, we, we operate within the framework of the, the legislation that established our QAA. I mean, the, the, the Health and Personal Social Services Quality Improvement Regulation Northern Ireland Order 2003 and the, the HSC Reform Act of 2009 and the individual sets of regulations uh, around the different services we regulate. Uh, some pieces of legislation uh, get reviewed and get changed, and we will then operate within that different framework. But, I mean, the, the core to the, the purpose of our QAA is the focus on the quality and safety of care for people in whatever model of care is going to be provided. Okay, um, thank you for that. I'm, I'm conscious of time. I know we've run over in our first session uh, and, and there is an ad hoc committee session which many members are taking part in later. But I would like to thank you for now for your presentation and your answers. And uh, I suppose this is an area that we will uh, return to over time given the very serious concerns that are ongoing within the care home sector and the serious situation there. Um, but for, for now, we wish you all the best and thank you for your presentation this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members. Thank you. Um, I'm now. Is there any way to know up up after that? What's that? Sorry. Written questions. Yeah, some written questions and some clarity just on. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are a number of outstanding questions. If members want to forward them, Elish, would that be the best way to do that? Um, would members wish me to gather them together and send them out for agreement of the committee before sending them on? Mm -hmm. So there's one issue I would like to explore, but I'm, initially I, I'd need to take advice. I wouldn't entirely be comfortable doing it in public session, and I don't know if there's a possibility to, for five minutes just to go into closed session, just to ask clarity on an issue. But or is it better to do it afterwards? Or it'll involve mentioning somebody's name, and I don't want to do that because I don't think that's fair. But okay, well I propose that we do that at the end at the end of the at okay. the end of the session. Okay. We'll, we'll, uh, do that. Clarity we'll do that after. That. Yeah. That's okay. fine. That's fine. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, moving on then, members, to uh, we're back to correspondence, um, and I think we had been discussing that there were a number of issues that that members were raising in relation to the department's response, and I think that uh, that that it would be it would be something that we would be very conscious of and that where, where we ask and where we ask for documents that those are forthcoming in a, in a timely fashion so we can consider them in the context of the time that we're, we're asking for them. So are members content to note, pending the briefing with the Minister next week, content to note items 7.2 and 7.3? Members are content. Item 7.4 is a response from the Department to issues raised by members at a briefing from the Chief Social Worker and Director of Mental Health, Disability and Older People on the 9th of April. Uh, any comment in relation to that briefing? No comment. So are members content to note that pending further engagement with the department? Thank you. Um, are members otherwise content with the actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Okay. So. Can I now refer members to table of papers and correspondence memo at tab 7.10 and I draw members attention to item 7.14. The Committee for Justice is currently engaged in committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill and invites views. The deadline for responses is the 5th of June so we'd have to agree a position by the 4th of June. This is extremely short notice and we have a, a very packed agenda between now and then. Do members have a view in relation to the Committee for Justice uh, Bill? Or, uh, yeah, Pam? Well, I think, Chair, um, it is vital that we do respond to it, given that um, the Health Department has the overall responsibility for the domestic and sexual abuse strategy. So I think uh, we should take some time, however we manage that, but we should take uh, some time to consider and respond appropriately. Okay. Any other views from members, particularly members on the phone? Are members content then that we either defer some of our briefings on 21st and 20th of May or seek additional input with, uh, or defer, extend or, extend or to have another meeting from stakeholders to get it with a view to responding because we would have to consult with stakeholders in relation to that? 
they would, so we would have to either defer some of our planned sessions or do an additional session. Have members of you on that? Additional. I would say additional. additional. Yeah. Members, members content that we schedule an additional Two. session? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm um, sorry, just on that, can, can we make sure that the likes of MAP, who represent men, domestic abuse, you know, so that when we get the evidence, there's, there's a couple of different charities that come and present? Okay, thank you. Um, so, are members then otherwise content with other other items of correspondence? Chair, uh, can I come in uh, just on that point? Yeah, go ahead. Pat. Uh, in regards to the email from Alex. Okay, Pat, go ahead. An appropriate time to come in on that. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just. I think it's a very unsatisfactory situation when we are inviting people to come to the committee and give evidence, uh, especially at a time when we're discussing uh, and, uh, discussing issues of life and death uh, and, and one of the biggest challenges we've ever faced, that there should be members of the committee show such disrespect. Uh, and I, I would like to to disassociate myself from from those activities that were going on last week. And I think the committee should also dissociate itself from what was happening. I acknowledge the apology was there, that's there. Uh, however, it's a, a, a very, very unsatisfactory situation. Shana. Okay. Um, are members content to note that, that, that the apology has been received and that it is unsatisfactory? in the, the situation that arose. Okay, thank you. Moving on then, members, to forward work. Can I refer members to the draft forward work program at tab 8.1 of the pack? Um, is there any issues that, that members want to raise in relation to that? Alan? Uh, just, uh, Chair, just in, in relation to the uh, briefing today that we received from what, what was billed as a, a panel of experts, and I have no doubt that they are all experts in, in their field, uh, but could I ask, uh, just uh, was the independent sage group, were they approached uh, to provide uh, spokespersons uh, to give a briefing today, or how, how were the names that, that of the people that were here today, how were they chosen, and, and who actually chose them to come? Because I thought that um, during the, uh, the presentation, I, I thought that they, they, they did drift a little bit into putting on a political hat at times, and uh, I think that the, the independent age group maybe is a little tainted with a, a political bias, but I mean, we had uh, remarks uh, from the panel today around Brexit, around the stock market, around uh, share prices, around the economy, around recession, world recession all things that maybe were more appropriate for the economy committee uh, so just really who, who, who chose them uh, and uh, but how were they chosen well i suppose the the uh, the process it was on the 30th of april i proposed that we invite a panel of experts people with relevant experience in relation to moving out of and at a meeting i think we i think there was full attendance at that meeting we were all there i initially proposed the 7th of may um, but the, the clerk advised that that would be too tight a time frame in order to, to have people prepared or people ready. We agreed that there were, and there were comments around the benefit, largely positive comments around the benefit of hearing from people with relevant experience. In view of the very short turnaround that was, that was involved, I asked the clerk to compile a list of people who would have relevant uh, experience in terms of past pandemics, in terms of, of their current work, and. Um, to forward a, a list of biographies, and we drew the panel in in order to get the session up and running today. We drew the panel from that list in terms of the most relevant that we could establish. Well, who, who made that actual decision? Did the, the, the choose? The I made the decision. I made that decision. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks. That's yeah, okay. And um, I will bring Jerry in in a minute there, but um, I do think that there is value in hearing from people uh, who have relevant experience and who have worked in this field and, and know how we can navigate our way out of what is a very unique and a very dangerous situation. 
Uh, Jerry? Yeah, sure. I think today was useful. I mean, we, we have presentations every single week and uh, quite often uh, we're asking questions and not getting answers or answers are danced around. And for the most part, I thought today was very um, straightforward and frank uh, and, and answers were given. If people don't like that, that's, that's another matter, uh, to be frank. And obviously, we are the health committee, but uh, they think that uh, the, the, the virus doesn't just affect health and doesn't affect anything else, I think, is a bit um, misguided or, or, or whatever. So I, I thought today was useful. And I would like to get those members back again at some stage, and if not, other people on top of that. But I thought today was, was very useful from, from my part. Any other members wish to apply? Just, just to say that um, I think the committee should be open then to, um, to any other um, expertise out there that wishes to come forward and speak to us and brief us. Yeah. Uh, Colin, yeah. were you. Oh, uh, the only thing I would say is that. Yeah, acknowledge maybe what has been said, but do you know what? You often get that from people that are presenting, and if they're medical experts, you listen to their medical advice. If they're proffering other opinions, you can choose to, to, to not listen to their economic output, but it really was their medical issue, and I think it was very informative. And as much as he said it didn't explain the R, I do feel like I've got a little bit more information about the R, so I think it was, it was worthwhile. And, and I do acknowledge that the, the, the situation is unique in terms of the d dynamics of it and the timeliness of it. And I think that there was a, there was a sense that time was drifting on. And had you had more time, I think it should have been done. Now, it's very important to say that this was the first of what we hope would be a number of panels. And if members are content, the, there, there, there are a further list of experts who we can now discuss. Now that we have a little bit more time, we can now present those. Members can suggest people who they feel have relevant experience. Um, and we can look at that in that context. But I agree that today's session, I think, was hugely valuable. I think because everything is so new, that we as a committee are largely dependent on, on sometimes people who are um, working very busily in terms of dealing with the current, the current epidemic, but working very close to it. I think an overview is useful for us as a committee to inform and educate us so we can do our job in terms of scrutinizing and advising more thoroughly. So if members are content, the, the further list of experts are, of expert potential for their expert panels can be circulated and we can decide them at meeting. What about our own chief medical officer would be, uh, um, I understand that the, the SAGE meetings that he attends um, are held on a Thursday, so there's maybe a difficulty, but you know, we haven't, I don't think we've heard from him and I, I think I would like to hear from him and it would be useful for the panel maybe to hear from him. Well, we have heard from the Chief Medical Officer, and we are hearing from him again next week. Maybe the Chief Scientific Officer. Is that, sorry, is that, yes, yeah, sorry. Which, which I think, myself, the Scientific Officer, sorry. Yes, no, I, and I think we have already indicated that we'd like to speak to, G, and, and I think that's that's in hand, Alan. I think yeah. that, that, yeah, I that think will be, be useful. Yeah, that will be absolutely mm -hmm. useful. So, are members uh, content to note the forward work programme then? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other business then? Do members have any other business? Sure, can I come in, please? Yeah, or Leah. Yeah. Um, yeah, just on the back of um, some of the discussion this morning um, with the um, the panel, um, there was some talk, obviously, around um, the COVID response and some of the coordination and challenges um, that we face on an all island basis. Um, and I've seen it earlier on in the week. There has been a COVID nineteen committee established. Um, in the doll, um, and I would like to propose that maybe yourself, as chairperson of um, our health committee, um, if you could maybe even write off to the chairman, um, it's the deputy uh, Michael McNamara, um, just for the purpose of um, really sharing any relevant information um, or updates that both of our committees may be working on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any any other views from members on that? It sounds. Yeah. Members content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Members are content with that. Thank you. Okay, members. Moving on to date, time, and place of next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 11:30 a.m. on Wednesday, 20th of May, 2020, in the Senate, when we'll be, we'll be joined by the minister and the chief medical officer. Thank you, members, and good luck. Stand live. Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.